Okay, um, good evening everyone. So welcome to the uh, part one of the webinar on the important considerations in the uh, cleaning process uh, development. So I will start off uh, the presentation topic first and then uh, midway uh, through the uh, presentation, uh, Beth will take over until the end of the presentation for this topic. Okay, here the goal is to understand the elements of a robust cleaning process and how to develop a cleaning program to ensure cleaning validation uh, success. So the point we want to convey from this picture is equipment design has a significant impact on the cleaning process of the equipment. So equipment that are designed with considerations in cleanability and sanitary design concepts uh, will have a more robust and efficient cleaning process. So whereas an equipment that are built without considering the cleanability may face challenges uh, in the uh, cleaning process that may not even meet the cleaning limits. So you will face a lot of challenges when the equipment that you have uh, does not uh, design to be uh, easily clean. So the current situation. Uh, so from our interaction with customers around this region and in other regions of the world, uh, sometimes we uh, come across customers a cleaning process that are very inefficient in terms of a long cleaning time, um, unnecessary long cleaning time, um, and also sometimes uh, they need to use uh, a lot of uh, multiple pre-cleaning steps and also high temperature. Uh, sometimes even uh, need to do a, a manual cleaning before the actual cleaning process. So all these are basically um, due to the fact that um, uh, there is no consideration uh, with regards to the equipment design aspects and also uh, the um, failures to understand the characteristics of the uh, process residues. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, these residues, uh, is it difficult to clean or hard to clean or easy to clean? And also solubility at what temperature and pH. So the characteristics uh, you need to understand. Uh, and also the um, uh, failures to establish an adequate cycle parameters. The means failures to understand what are the uh, critical cleaning parameters. So, um, and also the, um, um, sometimes uh, the uh, cleaning uh, agents are not uh, used and uh, use of the inappropriate cleaning agents can also play a part. So when we ask the customers, um, uh, how do you come up with this uh, cleaning uh, cycle parameters? So sometimes we get the answer that is the way that they always have done it. They have always done it this way. Uh, so uh, basically nobody look at it and nobody uh, try to uh, uh, look at it and how to improve the cleaning process. So this inefficient and not robust cleaning process will always stay in a company uh, in this way. So that is the uh, situation sometimes we encounter with uh, certain customers around the world. So today's agenda topics. Um, so I will touch on the details to consider when designing a robust cleaning process. So this will also include the equipment design issues and also some of the principles of sanitary design. So what are the things that you need to look out for um, when you purchase an equipment and also when you install the equipment process equipment in your plant? Make sure that uh, there are uh, sanitary design concepts incorporated in the equipment. And Beth will basically um, uh, take over the uh, last three bullet points on the understanding of the process soil and the uh, residue selection. And so what are the problems areas to look for? And lastly is the leveraging of the process equipment and the residue information into a cleaning study. Okay, an effective cleaning program will reduce the equipment downtime and lessen the risk of cross-contamination in multi product facilities. So building an effective cleaning program from the beginning is essential and should consider equipment design aspects, uh, residue selection, 
and also establish adequate cycle parameters. So once an effective cleaning program is developed, it will lead to a successful cleaning validation and at the same time ensure good understanding of the cleaning process. So now I will touch on the uh, designing a cleaning uh, program. So where to start? So basically, sometimes uh, when you have a new plant or when you have a new product, sometimes you do not know uh, where to start to uh, develop your cleaning program. So the uh, first point that you need to uh, look at is the uh, process flow. So what are the process flow in terms of the process uh, temperature, the process time, and also the uh, dirty hole time as well. Um, so what are the um, uh, equipment involved in this process flow, uh, including the dirty hole time? So the dirty hole time is basically, if, if you have a longer dirty hole time, uh, the more difficult it will be to clean the soil. So you will need to understand these uh, parameters. And then also you need to look at your process equipment. So what kind of process equipment that you have? So sometimes in the manufacturing plant, you have a lot of different process equipment. And uh, you need to understand what are the uh, material of construction of your equipment? Is it compatible with your product and also the cleaning agent? And um, any difficult to clean parts? Uh, sometimes the uh, equipment can be quite complicated. You need to understand what are the uh, uh, risk, high risk areas that can cause cleaning issues. Uh, so all this you will need to uh, understand uh, your process equipment and also identify which are the parts that were required to be removed from your equipment and clean out of place. And um, yeah, so, uh, so you need to understand what are the cleaning methods for each part of the equipment. Process soil as well. So if this is very important. So there are many, many different kinds of soil that you uh, can clean um, in different industries. So understanding the type of soil that you have, uh, it is, is it suspension, oil base, uh, powder, or solids? So different soil have different characteristics. And uh, understanding the soil characteristics is very important in terms of the uh, solubility and what pH, whether high pH, low pH, or uh, high temperature or low temperature. Sometimes the soil can be uh, more difficult to clean when exposed to high temperature, or you have the uh, multiple layers of the soil baked onto each other. So understand your process soil is very important. And then lastly, the uh, components of cleaning. So this is in terms of the uh, critical parameters of the cleaning process. So when you design a cleaning program, develop a cleaning cycles, you need to understand what are the uh, critical parameters. Uh, so typically it is uh, temperature, time, uh, cleaning action. Uh, so if whether you need to use the uh, cleaning agent or not, so there is the uh, chemistry as well. So my colleague Beth will talk in more details on the uh, different components of the cleaning process. So typically these are the uh, four main points uh, that you will need to consider carefully uh, before you uh, design a cleaning program. So next is, um, <clears throat> so you need to basically, uh, in order to design robust cleaning uh, cycles, you will need to understand the process. So one way is to meet with your team or the customers and have a discussion on the process residue details. Yeah, as I mentioned before, whether it's an aqueous base, oil base, uh, suspension, solids, powders, uh, understand the equipment surface MOC, the materials of construction, um, because uh, certain material of construction can have a different affinity for the soil as well, different kind of soil. So you need to understand the uh, what are the uh, the MOCs. So typically, most of the MOC is uh, 316 stainless steel, but they are other surfaces as well involved, uh, like the side glass and also the uh, teflon as well. So there can be quite a few surfaces involved. So try to understand uh, the equipment surface MOC and also the available cleaning methodology. So what are the uh, cleaning options that you have, whether uh, clean in place or clean out of place? 
That means uh, you have to take out the parts and put inside the parts washer or manual cleaning. So typically, I mean, manual cleaning is not preferable because the um, it has a tendency to have more variability in terms of the cleaning results because it is a manual process. So you need to carefully consider the cleaning methodology that you, you are going to use. And uh, know the uh, process temperature and process details. What are the temperature that the, uh, your process is going to have because temperature can have an effect on the uh, soil characteristics. So you need to understand uh, what are the maximum temperature and the duration and what effect it has on the soil on your surface. So any decontamination steps that you have uh, before the cleaning process or even after the cleaning process, whether you need to incorporate any decontamination steps. Um, and then the dirty hole time. So the dirty hole time is longer. The dirty hole time, the more difficult will be to clean the soil. And lastly is the restrictions. So any restrictions on your cleaning schedules, whether all the machine need to be cleaned at one time or some machine will need to wait because uh, sometimes the CAP process cannot happen to clean all the equipment at one time. So you need to basically schedule it and determine the uh, dirty hole time as well. So if you are using the um, uh, cleaning agent, then you will need to consider the waste discharge in terms of the pH requirements and also certain components, um, any restrictions in your own country. So all this you will need to take into, into considerations when you design a cleaning process. So this is a matrix example to show you um, this kind of matrix can basically helps you to uh, identify any cleaning challenges in any of the cleaning process. So uh, what this table shows is that uh, it shows the different cleaning process uh, for different areas. For example, soil number one is a wet granulation and then soil number two is a dry granulation. So within this soil one and soil two, what are the cleaning steps involved uh, and what are the equipment involved as well and the MOC of the equipment. So you can basically uh, make a comment, uh, any challenges you, uh, I, I expected uh, any challenges in cleaning or what are the uh, things that you can identify to basically um, to improve the process as well. So this is basically a table, a very good table to show you uh, the overall picture of your cleaning steps in your whole process and any uh, challenges you expect to see in any of the uh, cleaning uh, steps. So just uh, an overview information. Next is the uh, basically, um, so, so when you try to uh, design a cleaning process, sometimes when you have a lot of uh, complicated equipment, tanks, vessels, transfer lines, um, don't just look at the uh, P&ID, because P and ID, you cannot get the full picture. Uh, some information you will need to go down to the actual facilities, actual manufacturing areas, uh, and then you can get the information. So basically, you will need to go down to the actual site to look for possible problems before you start your cleaning process uh, development. So identify any corners, crevices, dead legs, uh, any valves, locations, seals, or sampling locations that can pose a challenge to the cleaning process. And identify, consider where contamination can occur. Um, and then if there's any contamination, potential contamination sites, so whether this can be fixed by re-engineering. So basically what you are trying to do here is to try to identify the problems first and fix it before you get into the cleaning process. Or cleaning or even cleaning validation. Because if you um, only discover the problems during the cleaning validation stage, you will lose a lot of time trying to fix the problem and redo the whole cleaning validation again. So basically, this is a very good way to identify the problems early, fix it before you get into the actual cleaning cycle development and also the validation. And also, uh, by Going down to the site, you can identify 
understand the process better, which part can be cleaned in place, which part will need to be taken out to be cleaned, um, so that um, uh, uh, you, you will know exactly um, the actual cleaning process required for each particular component. And then a uh, section need to be removed for cleaning, yeah, COP or use jumper or manifolds. So it's a very good practice basically to understand the whole process flow, the cleaning flow, especially when you have a, a complicated uh, cleaning uh, parameters or, 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 or the uh, PNID. Uh, it's good that you trace each line. Where does the cleaning solution goes and what are the possible problems? Understand this before you develop the cleaning process. So next, I will touch on the principles of the sanitary design. So uh, in the um, uh, industry, uh, equipment industry standards for the sanitary design, uh, there are actually uh, uh, three or four of these can be uh, used. So first one is the ASME bioprocessing equipment, so BPE. So this is a very good uh, design, I mean, guidance standards for sanitary design. And the other one is the P3A sanitary design standards. And also you have the European Hygienic Engineering and Design Group. And lastly is the American Welding Society. So all these standards provides a very good reference uh, in terms of the guidance for how you can design the equipment to be sanitary, to be easily cleanable. So it's, it's very good information um, to uh, get started on this. So this is just a uh, uh, highlights of some of the principles of the sanitary design. Uh, so, so some of the highlights, uh, of course, uh, no difficult to clean locations in your process equipment or system, uh, made of compatible materials with the products and also the uh, cleaning agents and uh, accessible, make sure that it is accessible for inspection, maintenance and cleaning, easily accessible. Uh, that is uh, one of the um, criteria because uh, if, you, if the cleaning is not accessible, chances are it will not be cleaned properly. And also no liquid or product collection. Uh, that means um, um, no stagnant uh, water or no stagnant uh, uh, things that can uh, basically uh, cause the uh, contaminants to uh, not clean properly. And hollow areas hermetically sealed. That means it's sealed properly without, because if there's uh, not sealed properly, then the contaminants can just trap inside those hollow areas. No recess, no, no niches is basically the uh, no recess. So these are just some of the highlights of the uh, uh, good sanitary design that should be considered when, um, when they design the equipment to be easily cleanable. So next we look at the, uh, some of the uh, equipment design issues leading to micro failures. So these are the, uh, some of the uh, things that can lead to micro failures. Uh, equipment surfaces not polished. So this is one of the uh, things that, uh, I mean, if your surface is not polished means not smooth. So uh, one of the criteria for cleanability is that your surface must meet I mean, the surface roughness must meet the uh, criteria for surface smoothness because the smoothness of the surface, uh, the easily, uh, I mean, the, the more easily soil will be clean. So if the surface is not polished, chances are the uh, contaminants or the product residues will not be easily clean from the surface. It could not drainable. And also the condensation issues. So these are basically the water left behind after cleaning. So any water left behind after cleaning tends to uh, cause microbial issues because uh, microorganisms can grow when there's a water present in the system. Poor welding. So poor, poor welding, uh, presence of crevices and rough surfaces. So this will tends to trap the product residues and microbial residues and reduce the cleanability of the system. So welding is very important. So in any equipment, you when you set the equipment, you need to basically make sure that the welding are done properly according to the standards. And then the tank, tank spray balls not sized properly, clock, uh, tank vent pipe is too long and difficult to clean. Some hollow rollers, um, hidden areas difficult to see and clean. So all this will basically prevent the, uh, the cleaning of the surfaces. 
equipment close to the floor. As you know, floor is the most dirty part of the room. So if it is uh, close to the floor, chances of contamination is high. And then uh, difficult to assess for cleaning and sanitization. So these are some of the um, equipment design issues that can lead to micro failures. So for the piping design issues, um, of course, uh, it's the dead legs and the ends in piping. So these dead legs must meet the requirements uh, stated in the standards. The L and D must not be more than two. Yeah, so that, those are the guidance. Uh, piping isn't drainable. That means the slope is not proper. Uh, missing low point drain buff. Uh, if, you, so if you have a low point, uh, you tend to collect the uh, water, will not be easily drained if there's no drain valves. Programming omissions uh, is uh, basically the uh, errors in uh, certain steps, missing certain steps in the cleaning process. Uh, inadequate flow rates as well. Uh, if you have an inadequate flow rates, uh, you will not be able to clean properly on the surface. Welding quality, leaky or faulty valves. So all these leaky faulty valves can breach the uh, sterile boundary and cause microbial contamination in your system. Uh, casket as well, if it is damaged, uh, ball and check valves uh, typically are not recommended because these are not easily clean. Uh, typically the recommended valve is the diaphragm valves and then the valves are not cycled during the CIP. So these are the, some of the uh, piping design issues that can lead to the micro failures. So for the uh, coverage, so uh, the CIP cleaning of tank is quite common using spray ball. So when you have the spray ball to clean a tank, uh, make sure that there's no shadow areas. Um, so shadow area is basically, in this case, you can see the example, if there's a top down stirrer, and if you only have one spray ball inside the tank. So when you perform the uh, cleaning, uh, the uh, spraying, is blocked by the uh, top-down stirrer, creating a shadow on certain part of the surface. So this surface is not in contact with the cleaning solution. So as long as there's no contact with the cleaning solution, means there is no cleaning. So this will cause the uh, cleaning failures. So in this case, you will need to have uh, two spray balls, basically to uh, ensure that the cleaning solution can be in contact with all the surface area in the uh, tank. So the uh, coverage testing is very important to make sure that uh, there is uh, contact with the cleaning solution. So typically it's performed using the lipoflavin procedures. Uh, you coat with the lipoflavin and then after that you dry it and then you run a short rinse cycle with water and see any parts of the surface uh, is there still lipoflavin remain. Uh, if there's a um, shadow part, then you will need to fix it uh, because if not, you will cause uh, cleaning issues down the road. So remember, no contact means no cleaning. So spray devices. So there are so many, many different kinds of spray devices. So spray ball provide, I mean, static spray ball, especially uh, provide adequate coverage, but not uniform impingement at all locations. So it's mainly provide a coverage. So basically, uh, if you have the uh, CIP using spray ball, so the solution coming out from the spray ball will hit the surface called the impingement. And then uh, after it hit the surface, it will flows down the side of the tank in another cleaning mechanism known as the cascading flow. So this cascading flow is one of the cleaning mechanism whereby it will remove the soil from the surface. So at the bottom of the tank, there is agitated immersion means uh, there's a certain amount of cleaning solution at the bottom of the tank, gently stirring. So that is also another cleaning action. So in a typical CIP uh, cleaning system, you have three cleaning mechanisms. So static spray ball uh, basically rely on high volume. You spray a lot of volume of water uh, with the cleaning solution, but there's a low flow cascading cleaning action. So if you have a static spray ball, the, operating pressure is lower compared to a, a rotary jet head. So rotary jet head is typically operating at a high pressure and it is a rotating. So this is basically uh, high impingement. And also the coverage, I, I mean, is uh, 
spray impingement is more on the surface compared to the static spray ball. So for the, uh, if you are using the uh, static spray ball, uh, make sure that uh, you have periodic maintenance in place uh, because if the uh, holes on the spray ball is blocked or clogged by particulates or contaminants, then you will affect the cleaning effectiveness of your CAP system. So in this case, uh, this spray ball was blocked by the metal shaving from the fabrication process in a new equipment. You can see that all the metal shavings, they fail to remove it from the system. So in the end, it all go into the uh, spray ball and block the uh, holes on the spray ball. So for the spraying devices, uh, typically the operating parameters is three to eight bar and uh, flow rate is basically, there's a guidance on, uh, there's a standard on the guidance. So for the st static spray device, uh, typically it can be a 2.5 gallon per minute per feet of circumference. So typically the uh, rule of thumb is the uh, amount, I mean the flow rate is uh, 2.5 to 3 gallon per minute per feet of circumference of the tank. So this is basically the amount required to basically have a good wetting on the surface to remove the residue. Um, Lower flow rate may be used when static or dynamic spray devices they are with 360 spray pattern. So if your this spray ball is has a 360 spray pattern, um, of course, lower flow rate then this can be used. For example, the rotary spray device, um, they can have the 2.1 gallon per minute per feet of the flow rate slightly lower because the uh, rotary spray device they basically move the water more on the surface uh, and then it can uh, create a, a more uniform layer of water flowing down the side of the tank. So basically these are just some of the uh, concepts uh, for the uh, different uh, type of spray ball applications in the CAP system. So next we just look at some of the, uh, this is the rotary jet head. So rotary jet head is basically uh, the cleaning solution is delivered through a vertical or horizontal axis. So this is a high pressure spray head. Um, as the time increases, the uh, coverage become more and more dense. So up to a point where almost all the surfaces are covered uh, with a high pressure spray jet. So this is another type of the spray jet that can be used. So next we go through the drainability. So this is very important, drainability. Uh, you, if you have a piping connection, I mean the pipes, make sure it's a freely drainable. So there is a requirement on the slope, uh, which is uh, 0.5 cm per meter. So this will need to be checked when you install the uh, equipment in your factory. Make sure that it's a uh, uh, slope free, freely drainable. And then also the uh, dead leg uh, requirements and the process connections. So dead leg is basically, uh, I mean, uh, if you have the uh, dead leg facing upwards, then you can trap air, basically trap the air. And then if you pitch it down, uh, it can have a stagnant uh, fluid at this dead leg. So you can basically, for this kind of thing, uh, you can uh, do it on the horizontal plane uh, to minimize this kind of problems. So for the T-joint, there are some recommendations as well, T-joint. So this is a very bad design. When you have a dead leg on the right, um, you should uh, make the flow into the dead leg and then out here so that to agitate this part. Uh, if you have this direction, there'll be a stagnant water here. Same for here, uh, if you have a T-joint, um, so you put it this way, if you flow this way, uh, then there'll be a tendency to have a stagnant water here. So it's better to basically uh, have uh, the deviation right when you put a T-joint. So the uh, uh, dead leg is basically, the, this is a requirement, the length over the diameter ratio must be less than two because uh, if you are too long uh, ratio, uh, this part will have no turbulence and poor mixing and poor cleaning as well. So basically this part is basically stagnant water. 
So this will create the issues in the uh, microbial contamination, as well as the product residue can trap at that part as well. So fluid velocity, so turbulent flow um, is uh, more than 1.5 meter per second. Um, so if you have a band, uh, you need to have a minimum velocity of five feet per second, which is 1.5 meter per second. Uh, minimum velocity to uh, minimize the formation of the air bubble trap at the elbow. So if you have a flow that is less than five feet per second, um, tendency to have the uh, air trap is very high. So once you have an air trap in the elbow, uh, this part will not have any cleaning effect. So because of because it is uh, blocked by the air bubbles, so uh, you may cause the failures in the cleaning. So it's very important that um, the velocity, you need to have the minimum velocity. Some will need higher velocity to remove the air trap as well. But the minimum recommended velocity is uh, five feet per second, which is uh, 1.5 meter per second. So this is uh, the flow uh, through the pipes. So Reynolds number is determined the turbulence. So this is a Reynolds number uh, uh, formula. Uh, of course, uh, typically you see the book, the guidance is basically laminar flow is right now is less than 2,300 and then turbulent flow is uh, more than 4,000. So uh, turbulent flow is uh, preferred in the pipe because it is basically more agitation compared to the laminar flow. Uh, but um, one point to note is that um, uh, depending, I mean, uh, it is not sufficient to only rely on the Reynolds number alone. You also need to take into consideration, as I mentioned before, the minimum velocity of 1.5 meter per second. So typically, uh, if you want to meet the 1.5 meter per second um, requirements, uh, your Reynolds number can be quite high, can be more than 10,000 or even more than 20,000. So the, the Reynolds number can be quite high for meeting the velocity requirement as well. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea on the uh, use of the Reynolds number together with the uh, velocity requirement that flows in the pipe. So sanitary connections. So welding is preferred for connecting pipes. Um, yeah, minimize the, um, the joints. Uh, weather connections should not have excessive cracks. Yeah, welding quality must be good. Uh, plus you have a cracks, you will track, trap the uh, contaminants. And also the uh, sanitary cram connection type, avoid the French cam type or traded connections. And caskets should be uh, partially exposed to the cleaning solution so that it can be uh, clean. Um, so these are the uh, corners. Uh, so you, you do not want to have a 90 degrees corners because that will create some kind of uh, trap the uh, the contaminants at the corner. So rounded joint is better than rounded corners, so easily drain. And then surfaces as well, the material construction, uh, you can have the glass line vessels or stainless steel. Uh, 316L is preferred for the uh, product contact surface because it is uh, smoother as well as the uh, more corrosion resistant as well. Uh, there are other type of materials, but you need to uh, assess the risk uh, make sure it is uh, suitable for its intended use. And also the polymers, uh, make sure that it's uh, FDA approved for product contact surfaces and the environment. Um, yeah, and then you need to basically make sure that they retain their surface and conformer, 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 conformer characteristics. Uh, and also ensure that the casket and o-ring use should not be non-toxic and non-porous and non-absorbent. So these are the uh, things that you will need to consider. Um, surfaces, yeah, surfaces, surface roughness. This is very important. Surface roughness, uh, as I mentioned before, um, for product contact surfaces, uh, it should be smooth uh, because uh, if you have a rough surface, it will reduce the cleanability of the surface. So there's a requirements for the product contact surface smoothness in terms of the RA. Uh, if you have a more rough surface due to corrosion, uh, you can also uh, cause the uh, biofilm formation on the surface. Uh, so this can lead to a lot of problems when you have corrosion occurs. So with that, uh, I end my part of the presentation. 
So um, if you have any questions, you can just write in. I will address the questions after Beth uh, presentation. So they can you make Beth the uh, presenter? Yeah, I'll, I'll make Beth the presenter. Okay. Okay, Beth is the presenter now. Beth? Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, Beth. Yes. Can you see me? <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet? Yeah. There I am. Correct. Okay. okay. Excellent. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, you know, first of all, figure out how to get this off of my screen so I can see what I'm talking about. All right. So, uh, thank you very much for having us, and I'm going to continue now talking about our process soils and how to understand your process soils. Um, the reason we're speaking about this, or the reason I chose to speak about this particular subject, is um, a lot of times when you have your drug product that you're trying to clean or you're active, we see a lot of times where people focus just on cleaning their actives and then everything else um, that's in that drug product is not considered. So you wanna consider everything that you're doing. So what Richard spoke about, you know, the process, your equipment, your um, conditions that you have, your residues. So I'm going to expand on the area of process residues. Um, so residues and soils, you can have the same soil, same residue, but as it goes through your process, it may be treated differently or you have one process from the other where you have different conditions and that can affect your soil. So we all know about, you know, if, you're, if you have a sugar or some sort of um, uh, caramel or something like that, if you have an oral salad dose, that when you bake it, it changes. You know that the, that residue will change. So similarly, this slide is meant to, to show that. So. Um, your actives, your excipients, your process materials, all of that um, has an impact, but it's also the amount that can be on the surface, so the amount of soil. And then the nature has to be considered. So is it uh, freshly deposited? Is it dried on during the process? Is it um, dried on during the dirty hold time? Um, so how long is your dirty hold time? Um, by drying on during the process, that is... Um, let me find my laser pointer here. So by drying on during the process, that could be, you know, due to heat or maybe due to um, uh, centrifugation or something where you're drying it. Um, is it baked, compacted? So the, the images over here is meant to depict the same soil looking at different process temperatures. So this is um, um, a protein on the surface and what the image on the left over here, it shows protein fouling, where you can see that the composition of that residue is 55% protein, 35% mineral, and 6% fat. But then after you expose it to a higher temperature, that same uh, protein is now mineral fouling, or what's considered mineral fouling, where the composition of that product actually changes. So it's now 17% protein, 75% minerals, and 6% fat. So what that means is, you know, the, the process to clean this soil over here, you know, perhaps that's more of a, an alkaline chemistry due to the protein uh, makeup of that soil, but then once you move over to mineral fouling, you might have to either add an acid or start with an acid for cleaning because you've just changed the composition of that soil. So that's why you want to consider what is that soil being exposed to during the process because that could impact your actual soil if you are not considering those conditions. Hmm. Okay, hang on, I'm trying to figure out how to flip my screen here. 
There we go. So when you're looking at your residues, you want to look at potential residues um, for consideration. So again, not only looking at your drug substance or your product, your API, you want to consider what else is going into that product. So if it's an oral product, what excipients are being added, what colorants, dyes, fragrances, flavors, those may be harder to clean than your actual API. And they're also more than likely found in higher uh, concentrations than your API. Your API may, very, may be a very small makeup of your overall drug product um, and when compared to your excipients and your colorants. You want to consider the preservatives that may be in there, any degradants or impurities that you may need to remove, um, any starting materials that may need to, that, that maybe were introduced during the beginning of the process or maybe in your raw materials that you need to consider any solvents that you're adding and how those affect the actual soil, especially if you're doing coupon studies. An example of that is looking at granulation product. So your granulation product could be wet or dry, but if it's wet and then by the time you get it to test and it's dried, it's going to change if you have to add that solvent back into that wet granulation for testing, it may become harder to clean. So you wanna consider that. And then you wanna consider everything else um, that may be added into your process, uh, lubricants, silicone, antifoams, silicates, anything like that, uh, bio burden, mycoplasma, endotoxin, anything that can contaminate your drug product, you may also want to consider for removal. Hmm. Oh. Having advancing problems. So how do you choose um, when you're doing a, a risk assessment or you're doing a cleaning study? How do you choose um, which one is going to be the greatest risk to your, your uh, process or your next product? So you'll want to consider anything uh, high potency, highly toxic, allergenic, anything that creates conditions that is unacceptable. So, um, for example, if you're adding flavorings and you go from, you know, you have a, a spearmint flavor in one and a grape flavor in another, those two, when, you know, although it's not toxic, and you may not even consider the flavorings, one could impact the other with the characteristic to the next drug product. And so that you may want to consider that when you're looking at what the greatest risk to the next process is. Um, so worst case soil selection is going to be based on the difficulty to clean, the potential carryover, and the risk the carryover presents to that, that next product that you're making. Um, for the residue evaluation, you know, it can be your API. It can be, um, you want to consider the excipients that you're cleaning because those may be harder to clean. Um, the product degradants you may have to remove from your process um, equipment. Your cleaning agents you're going to have to, to remove. So you should determine what your hardest to clean uh, residue is from that risk assessment. Design your cleaning process based on the removal of that hardest to remove soil and then set your acceptance criteria to whatever it is that is that most toxic representative um, component in your product. Um, if you are using um, HPLC, then you would look at both the cleaning process and your active. Um, but if you're using TOC, you would consider um, everything worst case, you know, both your, your cleaning agent, your active, anything else that's in there, you would consider that um, worst case because you would not be able to distinguish between uh, the different components. Um, so definitely, you know, you want to look at cleanability, toxicity, and solubility. Okay. So an example of this is looking at um, residue properties as a basis for cleaning. So an example of um, this would be an antibiotic suspension containing an active. So this is the example. Oh, there we go. Finally figured out how to advance. Um, so in this example, the original cleaning method was water, um, purified water, and then a dry. Um, at this particular site, they had no documented cleaning validation for many years. And so when they ran their cleaning validation, what they saw is they had API and unknown peaks on original cleaning valid uh, validation attempts. Their API was insoluble in water. So then the second method, they used an alkaline detergent, uh, followed by water, uh, purified water final rinse, and then a dry. And they had unknown peaks, um, were not detected, but the API is still insoluble. 
Then when they added an acid followed by an alkaline detergent with a water rinse and a purified water final rinse followed by a dry, what they found was that there was no residues or undetected peaks. And um, the unknown peaks were determined to be flavors and the API did dissolve. So what this means is they, they needed that acid detergent to dissolve the API, but they also needed the alkaline detergent to remove those um, flavorings because those are usually aromatic organic compounds. So they needed um, both in this case to remove their, their process residue. Um, so when you're considering the cleaning, when you're looking at, you know, for example, if you're looking at USP tables or solubility profiles and you, and you get the solubility of your drug and, and in this instance, um, in this example, let's say your solubility at a pH of seven, that's typically what it'll um, give you in those tables. It'll give you the solubility at a, at a neutral pH. So in this case, if you're looking at this uh, pH solubility profile for two different drug products and you go into your cleaning validation and you think, okay, um, drug A, based on this um, profile, it's going to be more soluble because here on the y-axis, the solubility goes up. So drug A is more soluble and drug B is less soluble. So this looks like your worst case uh, product would be drug B. But then if you are cleaning and you're using a caustic or a formulated alkaline detergent and your cleaning pH is going to be around 11, if you look at this profile then, drug B becomes harder, or I'm sorry, drug B becomes easier to clean because it becomes more soluble, but then drug A actually becomes your worst case. So when you are considering your cleaning process and you're looking at, at solubility of your active or different excipients, you wanna consider the pH that you're going to be using for cleaning, not a neutral pH, so just something to consider. Um, so again, just to reiterate, for the basis of cleaning, you know, the USP tables may or may not be um, useful in this. I mean, it'll give you an understanding of what that drug product is and what it's doing in the neutral pH, but you also, you know, you would think that it, it would get easier um, with an alkaline chemistry or an acid chemistry, but, you know, perhaps not. So how to leverage information for a cleaning study. So what, it, what to consider when you're, you're gonna set up a cleaning study and how to do it. So a lab scale cleaning study, um, it's the, opt you wanna optimize your cleaning parameters using a beaker or coupon study. And the reason you would do this is because um, the first point is that soiling is expensive at large scale because you're going to be using unknown parameters, which may or may not clean you have, you know, you're going to be using a lot more water, you're going to be using a lot more, you know, chemicals to do this, you tie up that um, equipment, so it may not be feasible because of the availability of the equipment. Um, the equipment may be tied up already for another product, and if you want to test it on a, a experimental product, that it may not be feasible in itself, because what if you can't remove it from the surface? Uh, your quantitative measurement of residue removal is easier at small scale because you can look at the coupons under different lighting conditions, different angles. Um, it's just a lot more sensitive. And then that matrix approach, you can run multiple conditions at the same time. And so what I mean by that is when you're looking at a large scale study, for example, you have one run, you're gonna use one cleaner, you're gonna use one temperature, in one concentration. And that may take you an hour, two hours, eight hours, whatever, to, to run that condition and you're tying up that equipment. But then with a coupon study or a lab study, what's happening is you can look at multiple cleaners under multiple temperature um, temperatures and under different concentrations of cleaning agents in different times. So you get a lot of data fast. So you can start um, having that, that process design, you, you start getting that information of, of the conditions that will clean your, your soils and you start understanding your soil and your process a little bit better. So where do you start? Typically alkaline cleaners are better for organic soils, tableting excipients, uh, proteins, fermentation residues, oils, waxes, fats, um, anything organic, if you think about organic material where acidic cleaners um, 
are a little bit better suited to, you know, metal oxides. So when you think of, you know, removing rouge or hard water scales, so the magnesium and calcium, any type of particulates, um, alkaline salts, minerals, that's where you want to start considering your, acid, your acidic cleaners. Um, sometimes you need both. Um, you know, you may want to have a, a rouge remediation or um, a rouge prevention program where you're using your alkaline cleaner followed by your acidic cleaner. Um, sometimes you may have a situation where you have an oral solid dose product where you have uh, flavorings or coatings or, you know, thin film coatings or um, something where, you know, you need both an alkaline and an acidic cleaner to remove the different components in your drug product. So a laboratory um, test procedure. The first thing is, you know, you take your coupons, clean your coupons to make sure that they're clean. You're not starting with anything on those coupons. So you start with dry, clean um, stainless steel coupons. They are uh, weighed on an analytical balance to get the pre-coating weight. Um, your coupons are coated with your sample and then exposed to whatever soil conditions you have in your process. So that's why it's important you know what's going on with your process. Um, you develop your cleaning parameters by starting first with the beaker study. Um, it's That's what's called agitated immersion or, or soaking. So you determine what chemistry um, best suits that soil. And then you look at the coupon um, and you look for visually clean, water break free, and then a weight change. So the three methods um, that we use are um, the visually clean, water break free, weight. You can test for TOC, you can test for HPLC, um, but um, you can look at under different visual lighting conditions, different angles, different distances, and um, determine your, your cleaning parameters using this methodology. So performing that lab scale cleaning study, again, the parameters that you're looking at are time, your action, your chemistry or concentration that you're using and your temperature. Those are your parameters that you're going to be able to manipulate during your process cleaning study. Your criteria are the criteria that we use, visually clean, water break free, and a gravimetric assessment. Visually clean coupon, um, cleanliness is confirmed using a large stainless steel coupon. Post cleaning, the coupon is rinsed for 10 seconds and it's visually clean if the um, sample is or and the detergent is um, not visible on either side of the coupon and the visual limit of detection is typically about four um, microns per centimeter squared. So that would be an example over here. This would be an example of a coated coupon. Obviously, that would be a still a soiled coupon or not visually clean. And then the coupon over here on the right would be visually clean. A water break fee free test is a very sensitive um, test. It's a visually clean coupon is rinsed with um, deionized water or milliQ water, purified water, and tested for um, what's called water breaks. So what that does is it tests for hydrophobic uh, materials on the surface of that coupon, so it's very sensitive. Um, the coupon, uh, again, it's rinsed for 10 seconds, and then the surface is examined as the, the film of water drains over that coupon, and so it will break around a hydrophobic um, soil or a protonaceous soil, and if the surface is clean, the water will form that, that thin continuous film, but if not, like the coupon on the right, you'll see breaks, so that's not considered um, water break free. Uh, the water break free test method is based on an ASTM uh, A380 standard practice for cleaning, descaling, and passivation, where it does test for the presence of hydrophobic contaminants. So the reference is there if you'd like to um, review that, that document. But it's um, applicable for only items that can be dipped, and it's a rapid test. It's non-destructive, but obviously it's not something that you're going to do in your piece of equipment because that's going to be very hard to... Uh, visualize in a piece of equipment. So it's um, meant for coupon studies or intended for coupon studies. The acceptance criteria for um, gravimetric assessment is um, the coupon is considered 100% clean by weight if it's pre and post weight are less than 0.1 um, meg of each other. Uh, we use uh, coupons in our lab that are 116 squared centimeters. 
and the sensitivity of the balance corresponds to less than five micrograms per centimeter square, assuming a uniform distribution on that coupon. So what this is showing is um, residue buildup over time. So in this instance, we were working with a um, customer who implemented a cleaning program based on the cleaning that they um, already had in place. So when they did the validation, they the equipment was uh, swabbed and it was visually clean and it was determined by swab to be, to be um, clean. It met their acceptance limits. But then six months later, what happened is they were failing visually clean. And so, you know, they, they contacted um, they contacted me, contacted um, our, our group, and, and I was the one that was um, working with them. And what happened was, is that um, they were just trying to troubleshoot, you know, just was something going on uh, with the detergent, was something going on with their process, you know, did, you know, something they thought happened. So what we did is we um, took their current cleaning methodology and um, we did a coupon study. And so what we determined is that our cleaning recommendation had required a little bit more aggressive conditions than what they were using already. So, um, so then we just wanted to see, well, what they were using was that, you know, maybe could we see what was happening at their site? And so what we found is the coupon on the left, so the coupon over here. This is based on a cleaning study with soiling the coupon one time and then using their conditions to clean. So in the case of the coupon, you can tell right away that it was not visually clean. This wouldn't have passed and it didn't pass in our coupon studies. Um, so you know, right away we know that that didn't work. But when they were doing their cleaning validation, this still met their acceptance criteria. And in that piece of equipment, you could not see this on the side of the equipment. In the, the middle coupon here, what this represents is five soiling. So we soiled the coupon and cleaned it using their previous um, cleaning uh, process, and then soiled it again, cleaned using their cleaning process, soiled it again. So we did that five times. And you can definitely see it in the second coupon. Um, but what we figured out is that over that period of six, six months, they did 15 cycles. So we did the same thing over here and we did 15 cycles and that's to the point where they were able to see it on their process equipment. So you can see how powerful the coupon study is where on this first coupon, you could see it after one time, um, but it took on a piece of equipment, it took 15 cycles to actually fail that visually clean uh, surface and fail their limits. Um, so the other thing to point out here is this is a really good uh, method for looking at worst case soils because if you were doing this and you had a program and you had a, a cleaning program that you were using and you had a new soil come into your um, manufacturing operation and you wanted to see if you could still clean it using your current cleaning methodology so you could either set this up as a screen or you could set this up to determine your new parameters. So in this case the screen would have failed that that coupon and and let the you know let them know that it was not um, applicable that they couldn't use that same process to do the um, clean this residue that they would have to do an adjustment to their cleaning process development. So in this next slide what this is showing is using coupons um, this is that same coupon residue buildup over time. So this coupon over here, this is the same soil with a one-time application of the residue and then cleaning under the process conditions. So under um, same coupon, different angle. So here you can't really see the residue, but in this coupon you can. So this shows that you know if you were looking in that piece of equipment, you probably were not able to see that residue, but when looking under a different angle, you could. And then this is after 15 uh, soilings. So this would be this past coupon over here. Looking at different angles, you can see the residue in both um, angles. So in this case, you know, you wouldn't see it under the first um, cleaning, um, but after 15 cycles, you can see it under both angles. And then residue buildup over time. When you are looking at your equipment, you want to look at both um, wet and dry conditions, but it's very important that you look at your piece of equipment when it's dry, if you're doing a visually clean um, um, inspection. 
because what this one shows is the same coupon, different angles, both of them wet. So in this angle, you can kind of see the residue, but not really. Um, but under this angle, wet, you can see it. Um, but in the case of the dried material, both coupons dry, you can see it under both angles. So it's important that when you're you're inspecting your equipment for visually clean that you look under wet, but definitely under dry conditions. So that would be the recommendation is just look under dry conditions because you're you're going to be able to detect, um, you should be able to detect um, some of that residue. And some of these uh, residues that you can't see really when it's wet, like um, titanium dioxide uh, or uh, any of those types of uh, minerals, it really takes, you're not, you don't really see those thin films until the piece of equipment is dry. So you can also use laboratory um, studies for different applications. So in this next case study I have is it's looking at um, remediation for severe corrosion in a centrifuge. So this right here is a, an Alpha Laval centrifuge with severe corrosion on the stainless steel um, 2205 duplex parts. So the cover, the distributor, and what they were doing is they were cleaning using a formulated uh, chlorinated cleaner, um, but under aggressive conditions. So they were causing rouge in these parts that had higher chromium content. So not in the stainless steel um, 316, but in the duplex parts that have a higher chromium content that was they were experiencing this bronzing. So um, what the lab did is they did an evaluation and they showed discoloration occurred after 14 exposures, which correlated to seven process cycles. So a pre-cleaning and a post-cleaning for this particular um, case study. An untreated coupon, you can see, so it's still that shiny stainless steel, but post-exposure, you can see that it started um, bronzing a bit. So this is the coupon on the right is post exposure 6% detergent at 65 14 cycles 3 hours each. So you know aggressive with a high detergent concentration um and in 3 hour cleaning so you start seeing some of this bronzing. So the rem the remediation was is um, a coupon study was performed and what they found was that when they incorporated the use of an acid after every cycle, so using a 4.5% acid detergent at 65 degrees C for 30 minutes, uh, pre-treatment, the duplex material looks just like the duplex material after exposure, after 14 uh, cycles. So this is an example of using a cleaning study to remediate a rouge situation where you can hone in on those exact conditions instead of, you know, maybe trying to determine a frequency or hitting it with a higher acid uh, concentration, temperature, time, um, to try to remove that rouge. So what they did is they, they honed in on a cycle with the exact parameters to keep that in check. All right, so, Looking at your cleaning process, design is, um, it's just more than just looking at your residue or considering your, your residue, but you need to consider your residue but in, and how it is in your process. You need to consider the equipment. Uh, so look at the design. Is there anything that you need to go in and try to um, fix or work around or take off and remove and clean out of place? Look at your uh, materials of construction and make sure that they're all able to be exposed to the cleaning um, agents and that they don't interact with the actual residue itself. An example of that is, um, for example, proteins and polystyrene. Uh, proteins will bind to polystyrene, so it's you know it's kind of the basis for enzyme-linked amino assays. So you want to make sure that there's no interaction between your residue and your material of construction. The types of soils to be removed, so the type and the amount, so what kind of soil are you working with and how much? Do you have a, a mass or um, a thick coating that needs to be removed or maybe you need to do a pre-wash or consider that? Is it the, so, you know, the soil on that surface, is it going to bake on if you do a pre-wash under certain temperature conditions? So you want to consider that. Your manufacturing conditions, your cleaning methods, um, the different mechanisms 
uh, that are out there for cleaning, the cleaning parameters you have, and the cleaning agent. So you want to consider all of these aspects when you're developing a cleaning methodology. So it's it's not just a cleaning product, it's not just your soil, but it's you want to consider everything holistically. And lastly, I just want to um, mention the ISP Cleaning Validation uh, Lifecycle Good Practice Guide. So it was um, it was out in last month, so actually it's October now. So it came out, it was published in September, and topics that it covers are application of risk management, life cycle approach, cleaning methodologies, uh, visual limits, um, acceptance limits. So there is a link to it on this slide so that you can you know, review the document if you wanna download it. Um, but there, what I really wanna mention is that there's gonna be a complimentary webinar on Wednesday, October 21st from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. So again, it's a, a complimentary webinar. I encourage you to sign up so that you can um, kind of get a preview of what's in the document and you know understand the scope, the content, the um, application of it, review uh, the, you know, a summary of the, the content chapter by chapter. And there is a link to the, the webinar registration page as well at the bottom. So uh, right here is a link, so I encourage you to sign up for the complimentary webinar and uh, check that document out. And with that, thank you very much for your time and attention, um, you know, from Richard and myself. And if we have any questions, I guess we're opening it up now at this time. Yes, we'll open it up for questions. So, Beth, I will also make you the organizer so you can see the questions. Uh, okay. Richard is already the organizer. He can see the questions. So, Richard, you can go ahead and start reading the questions and see. So, Beth, here you are the organizer now. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Richard here. Um, I have one question on this. Uh, the question is, uh, what if I have a good turbulent flow? but not meeting five feet per second velocity. Is that acceptable? So basically, um, there are two criteria you will need to meet actually um, for good cleaning in the uh, piping. So first is the turbulent flow. So for turbulent flow, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, presentation, is basically Granite's number is greater than 4,000. So if and then the other requirement is the velocity of the uh, flow, so which is five feet per second, because this is required. A uh, study was conducted basically to uh, uh, at this velocity, um, the air will not be uh, trapped in the uh, band. So if you have a velocity which is lower than five feet per second, uh, there is a high risk or high chance that uh, some air bubbles may be trapped at the bank. So it's, um, so you need to make the assessment. So there's a risk basically. So uh, I mean, if you are seeing more cleaning failures and if you have a low velocity, lower than five feet per second, so you may want to look into this, investigate, see whether this is one of the causes of the failures. Because if you have a low velocity, uh, chances are some of the uh, bubbles can be trapped which can affect the uh, efficacy of your cleaning process. Okay. okay, Beth, you want to take one question? I'm trying to see if I can see the questions. Um, <laughs> you can see, you can see the question? Uh, okay, you want me to read it out to you? Yeah, I'm thinking this is a question, but I'm not sure if that's what he just answered or not. What kind of cleaning methodology to be adopted for continuous manufacturing? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's right. What kind of cleaning methodology to be adopted for continuous manufacturing? I wish I could make the window bigger. It's like so small. Um, it, so, okay, okay. Beth, I'll, 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 I'll read it out to you. I'm used to it. Small windows. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. To, so what tiny. kind of cleaning methodology uh, to be adopted for continuous manufacturing equipment train? where sampling of swab and physical verification is not feasible? Mm, that's a tough one because the cleaning methodology, I mean, if you can clean with water, use water. Um, but a lot of times we find that that's not an option. So you would, you know, incorporate in, you know, either some type of 
formulated chemistry to clean the, the soils. Um, but for me, it should be the same, but you should be able to go in and, you know, cause if, especially if you're going to be doing, um, if you're going to be doing, you know, campaigning where you're just running and running and running, um, but you should be able to break that piece of equipment open and, and verify on some or, or pull a sample on some predetermined frequency and you know whether you just have to define that so you define what you're doing so I don't I don't know if I can recommend that but you're gonna have to stop at some point and and be able to open up that equipment based on some some frequency and and sample and see how to clean that equipment and that can be based on a risk assessment with you know considering uh, you know, your raw materials, your contribution to contamination, you know, bio burden, um, you know, the point where you're impacting your batch or uh, so you want to consider all those things in a risk assessment and figure out that frequency and be able to, to take that sample. Thank you. I don't know if Thank that you. helps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, delegate, just let me tell you, we'll be taking questions for another 15 minutes. And after that, Paul would be making his presentation, which is on biofilm remediation and removal. So questions on this session will go on for another 15 minutes. And then at the end of Paul's uh, uh, presentation, you can ask all questions again. So we continue with questions for this session. Uh, the yeah, next have... question is, yeah, go ahead, uh, Richard. Yes. Yeah, I have uh, one so one question here. Uh, so, what will be the ideal limit for product non-contact parts after cleaning? So, I assume that you are referring to those uh, non-product contact parts and the product contact parts that are washed in the uh, same parts washer. Uh, so, in those instances, um, I mean, you can. I mean, since you are using the uh, same cleaning process, uh, I mean, you can use the uh, same limits for both for the product contact parts and the non-product contact parts uh, but the uh, i mean the sampling frequency or sampling points can be lesser on the uh, non-product contact parts here so that is uh, one of the options that you can consider thank you uh, so next one that i'll read out uh, would you be able to make few comments on a bracketing approach for cleaning validation Mm. Think about that now. So a bracketing meaning um, uh, looking at different, you know, like a grouping. Yes. Is that grouping. That's right. so grouping. Yes. yes. Um, well, yeah, you can you can group your equipment. You can group your products. You can group. I mean, you, there's a lot of different things that you can group to make your your life easier. So now what I would do is it just depends on you know, what type of facility you're in. If you're in an oral salad dose facility, you may want to bracket those products that are either, you know, highly potent, toxic, um, maybe, you know, look at your enteric versus your non-enteric type products because some are going to be harder to clean than others. Um, so obviously your enteric coated or thin film coated, those are going to be harder to clean than your, you know, your non-enteric um, coated. So you may want to group your products like that, if you're in a facility where you're doing, you know, animal derived and non-animal derived, you may want to group your products according to to that. Um, or, you know, there's there's a lot of different uh, factors that you can apply to group. For equipment, equipment needs to be grouped. You know, as long as they're using the same process, the equipment is the same configuration. They can be different sizes, but it has to be you know, roughly the same configuration and the same cleaning methodology and kind of the same point in the process because you're not obviously going to group, a, you know, something that's upstream like a, you know, a granulator <clears throat> that's that's used upstream or a spheronizer with something like a, a bed dryer or something like that where there's two totally cleaning methodologies and, you know, different processes, different soils. So you want to consider all of that when you're trying a grouping strategy. So you can, you know, break it down. I usually start by making the 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 actual categories pretty broad, and then try to you know narrow it down from there, and then pick you know one or two products in each category and look at those. Um, if it's equipment, oh sorry, in equipment, if you're dealing with different sizes, you may want to do one of a small, one of a of a large. If you have different you know sizes but the same configuration, you may want to look at both spectrums. 
Thank you. Uh, Richard? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there's one question here on the, um, what is the uh, basis of deciding on the flow rate of 2.5 gallon per minute per feet? So this uh, amount, I mean, this um, flow rate per feet uh, is, uh, I mean, there's a uh, studies done before uh, that uh, they have determined this flow rate between 2.5 gallon per minute per feet to three gallon per minute per feet per feet. This amount, I mean, this flow rate is sufficient to wet the uh, inner side of the uh, tank uh, so that uh, the cleaning process can be more effective. There's a good wetting. Uh, if you have this flow rate. Of course, uh, this is referring to the uh, static sp spray ball. So if you are using different kind of spray ball, for example, the rotating spray ball, uh, you can have a lower flow rate because rotating spray ball, the way the spray is, there are more uniform um, distribution of the water on the surface. Uh, so uh, on that basis, you can uh, reduce the uh, flow rates to about, I mean, can be a 2.1, uh, gallon per minute per feet. So there are studies done before which uh, are published in the articles. So this is a rule of thumb here. Yeah. Of course, it can go higher a little bit. Yeah, there's no harm in going higher a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, back for you. Uh, what will be the ideal limit for product non-contact parts after cleaning? That is the... Uh, didn't Richard already get that one, I thought? Richard, did you answer this? Yes, yes, I answered. Limits for no, okay, thank you. That's about it. Mm. Uh, what here, is the accept, uh, sorry, what is the acceptance criteria for dead legs? Acceptance criteria, the same as the rest of the equipment. <laughs> so your acceptance, you mean acceptance criteria as far as your your limits? Yes. Um, dead legs. Yeah, it's it, your it, it's going to be exactly the same as another piece of equipment. So it, it shouldn't have any different uh, limit. Um, okay. Yes, Richard. Spray ball. One of the main. It is one on the regulatory reference. Any regulatory reference for rapoflavin tests? Um, so far, I have not come across a regulatory documents reference yeah. specifically for rapoflavin tests. So typically this is, uh, I mean, um, based on the articles publication that mentioned this test, yeah, but not in the regulatory documents. Yeah, I haven't either. And I've looked because I was trying to find a reference for the temperature and I, I found a document. So I have that document I can send to people. Um, but I was just trying to even find something to for a recommended temperature because typically people do it in ambient, but I was trying to find where that was written down and I couldn't find it. I mean, I did, but not in anything, not in any guidance, not in any regulation. Uh, there is one more question on dead legs. Uh, mm -hmm. Dead legs are different in size as per different guidances. So on which guidance do we need to rely? Mm, I would use, um, so go back to the, the beginning of the, let me find my, let's see. So you can go to, you know, any of them, you know, really the one that we referenced here was the uh, handbook cleaning in place, the guide to cleaning technology and the food processing. But you can, uh, for me, I reference the ASME BPE and I would look there first, um, but just pick one and and stick to it define it okay. say what you're going to do and then do what you're going to say do what you documented you said you were going to do okay yes richard okay this one here let's see uh, uh, mm. we can never have a straight pipe and there will always be elbows does it mean it is a must to ensure five feet per second regardless of turbulence number yeah, I mean, uh, it's, yeah, it's a, I, I think it's a similar question that uh, if you have a speed that is lower than five feet per second, there's a higher risk of the bubbles trapped in the elbows. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if, I mean, you need to assess the risk and if you are seeing more failures and then you can investigate um, your velocity, whether 
that is a cause of your continuous or sporadic failures in your cleaning. Yeah, so it just increases the risk. I mean, if you have a lower velocity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing you want to pay attention to is the orientation of the elbow. Because if the elbow is coming off a horizontal going down, you're going to have that siphon effect too. So you may want to consider the, um, there's a, a reference from ASTM for the branching, and that discusses tubing um, ID and flow rates as well. Because you don't, you know, obviously if you have something going up, you can use less of a flow rate than something that is, you know, draining down. So you want to avoid the siphon because then you'll get the air bubbles in the corner and I'll tell you, you will fail. Okay, thank you. Uh, how can we prove that the lab scale cleaning approach is authentic for effective cleaning of process equipment? I mean, the scalability when you're doing the lab scale studies. Your XP, yeah, the, the lab scale study is just what it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an evaluation, it's a screening. It's not the in situ testing, um, but it gives you a, it gives you data and then you can go to the process equipment and do a trial. Um, so you want to do that before just going to the piece of equipment and just either, you know, using what you were using before or guessing or, you know, at least you have some, some data and it, it, it provides you, but obviously you're going to want to trial it. You're not going to want to rely solely on a coupon study. That's a screen. Okay. Thank you. I think with this, we will stop the question and answers here. And we will go ahead now with the second presentation of Paul. There he is. So, uh, yeah, I will make him the presenter. So, Paul, the control of the screen is with you. And till the time you are getting your presentation on, I'll give a brief introduction. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to the second presentation in this conference. And this presentation is titled Biofilm Remediation and Removal. This presentation will be made by Paul Lopolito. Paul is the Technical Services Manager for the Life Sciences Division of Steris Corporation. He currently manages the process and cleaner evaluation PACE uh, program and provides global technical support related to process cleaning and contamination control, which includes field support, uh, site audits, training presentations, and educational seminars. Paul has over 25 years of industry experience and has held positions as a technical services manager, manufacturing manager, and laboratory manager. Paul is a frequent speaker at industry events, including ISP. Paul has published several articles and book chapters related to microbial contamination, biofilm remediation, and cleaning validation. Paul's presentation will also be for around 60 minutes, which will be followed by Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul. Over to you, Paul, for your presentation. Uday, thank you for the introduction as well as um, ISP India for the invite to present during today's uh, talk. Hopefully everybody can see my screen addressing biofilm and pharmaceutical manufacturing. Yes, and we can see your screen. Thank you. Uh, so go ahead and use the chat function to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation and as Uday mentioned, there's going to be time at the end uh, for uh, to address any questions. So the agenda for the talk is going to cover what is biofilm. Uh, secondly, it's going to talk about why should I be concerned about biofilm. Uh, the third is going to be in regards to, you know, how can biofilm or biofilms form in equipment and piping. And then we're gonna talk about impact of rouge or corrosion on biofilm formation and remediation. And then we're gonna get into an, a holistic approach for biofilm remediation. And that's gonna focus on a few items. Uh, one is understanding the process systems. 
And that is something that Richard and Beth did an excellent job presenting in the previous talk. So understand the process system, then effect of residue on remediation. As Beth noted, understanding that process residue drives your cleaning procedure. Now, if you're dealing with the microbial contamination, we want to understand how that impacts the cleaning procedure. Then get into cleaning and disinfection. And also share um, uh, what they call the CDC biofilm reactor method. So as the previous uh, presenter talked about using coupon studies to look at cleaning, we now have some standard methods to grow bacteria in a biofilm and understand things like cleaning and disinfection of organisms within a biofilm. And then share some related research and, and, and wrap it up with some case studies. So what is biofilm? Biofilm is uh, a single species uh, grown in a community, or it can be multi-species grown in a community, and it secretes um, uh, what they call extracellular uh, polymetric substance, or which consists of polysaccharides, nucleic acids, uh, lipids. Uh, it's basically uh, an environment in which the organism uh, can grow, um, communicate with uh, other organisms of the same species or different organisms, um, as well as have a protective environment to environmental stresses, uh, such as introduction of chlorides, heat, and other components. Um, there has been, uh, it is not a new concept. I did find an article from uh, Zobel and Anderson that dates back to 1936. Uh, from the Woods Hole Research Facility, and they talked about microorganic films uh, in salt water, as well as in fresh water. And they talked about nutrients concentrating uh, within these groupings of cells. Um, and so it was a very, you know, an early reference to, uh, to biofilm. Uh, we can see uh, phenotypic differences of the cells, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. We can also see uh, populations that consist of vegetative and endospores, uh, so that becomes quite challenging. Uh, we can also see changes in growth rate uh, when organisms are in a biofilm, as well as in different layers within the biofilm and we can even see different gene trans transcriptions of the organisms that are in the biofilm condition. Now, we talked about this extracellular polymeric uh, substance, uh, often referred to in the industry as EPS, and it consists of polysaccharides, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. And this is something that um, can be harder to clean than process residues, and it can reduce organic, this organic material can reduce the efficacy of biocides, especially uh, chlorides, peroxides, those can all be um, uh, inhibited with the presence of organic material. And this residual EPS can reduce penetration of biocides, so in, in, in the function of the biocide, it needs to be in contact with the, with the microbe. So if it's unable to penetrate a biofilm, then it cannot be in contact with the organism and you cannot get uh, efficient kill. And that's the same thing with using steam or heat. If there's an insulating mechanism of an organic material, this biofilm, then it can reduce the effect of steam or temperature on the system. And we have a couple of images that's seen here of, of cells as well as that EPS uh, surrounding the cells uh, within uh, some images. Oh, is this, you know, is this, is this critical? Um, I have two graphs here. Uh, the first one on your left 
uh, talks about inactivation of Pseudomonas aeruginosus cells in suspension. And they're treated with uh, 3% or 12% dilution of a ready-to-use uh, spore side. So this would be kind of sanitizing concentration. And what we see is using a single, a single uh, tube method, so uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosus grown in suspension, treated with either 3% or 12%, and that's a volume-to-volume -volume dilution, and we see a significant log reduction within the first minute. So starting off around seven and a half logs of Pseudomonas aeruginosus, and within a minute, actually in seconds, we have a full, a full kill. However, we take that same organism, Pseudomonas aeruginosus, we grow it in a dynamic biofilm model, and I'm gonna talk about that later on in the presentation. We now shift that, that chemical resistance from with exposure to a 3%, 6%, 9%, 12% of the same ready-to-use uh, uh, sporocyte that's been diluted to those concentrations. We now start to see that it can take um, uh, minutes, even hours, to show uh, similar efficacy. Uh, so you can see that the presence of that EPS, that presence of that organic material associated with the biofilm is reducing the efficacy of a product that should be able to kill the organism in seconds is now in hours. Now, microorganisms rarely exist as a single cell or even as a pure culture, but rather as a monoculture um, or a mixed culture of different microorganisms. Now, biofilms typically uh, follow a similar route of formation, and that's shown in uh, this cartoon. And this cartoon um, uh, is from the Center for Biofilm Engineering in Bozeman, Montana and that's uh, at the Mo Montana State University. And this image is a nice cartoon to kind of depict attachment, growth, and detachment. So organisms uh, first need to condition the surface. So they'll generally um, uh, put out proteins, uh, lipids, things that will favor attachment of, of the cells. And then there is attachment, and then this colonization and growth, and then you start to see uh, detachment. Uh, so you may see uh, very high levels in one sample and low levels in other samples that are taken as these organisms are detached from the surface. And really the flow rate within a system can imply that you can have a thick uh, biofilm within piping in our equipment, or can be in a, in a uh, high shear environment in which you have very thin layers of organic uh, material, biofilm material. And these can be quite complex. And, and like I said, can be a single species or multi-species within uh, biofilm. I wanted to share some work that was done um, at the Bozeman, at the Center for Biofilm Engineering in Bozeman, Montana. And this was using a confocal microscope, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosus, uh, labeled with uh, green fluorescent protein. And we are seeing that, I'm going to try to show a video, and treated with uh, a sporocyl agent. And this is on a glass, um, uh, a glass uh, tube that's been set up to do live imaging with the confocal microscope. And we're seeing this Pseudomonas aeruginosus, uh, and this is, um, it's not quite time, it's, it's time-lapse photography, but it's been edited. And within uh, three minutes, you see a complete kill of the Pseudomonas aeruginosus. And we go with an alkaline detergent, we also see the, the green fluorescence of the Pseudomonas aeruginosus. And in this case, 
we're looking at about three times uh, in three times the length of time to uh, have full kill of the organisms. However, when you look at that surface after the sporicidal agent, and this is a, a parasitic acid hydrogen peroxide blend, we're seeing um, quite a bit of residue left on that surface of, of, uh, of glass. However, with a formulated alkaline detergent, it's a, in this case, it's a slower kill. Um, however, you have a much cleaner surface um, after uh, the organisms have been killed. So one of the things that we want to always think about when we're treating uh, microbial contamination, especially if it's expected to be in a biofilm condition, is we want to make certain that we can remove um, that organic material associated with the EPS as well as uh, killing the organisms uh, within the biofilm. And that's an important element because the first step in bioform formation is that conditioning of the surface, which I talked about earlier. So if you do not clean the surface, then you speed up the rate of reattachment and, re and regrowth of a biofilm within a system. So oftentimes we see in the field that um, individuals will start to increase the frequency of sanitization or even increase concentrations of sanitization. And it's all because they're not, um, they're, they're killing the organisms, but not uh, cleaning the system, um, which encourages um, uh, reattachment and growth. So why should we be concerned with this? Well, I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, citations um, over the years, just looked at the past six years, uh, and in specific reference within uh, the U.S., the 21 CFRs to 11.113, control of microbial contamination, we see over 900 um, uh, violations on that. We see 1,800 violations in regards to equipment cleaning and maintenance, and over 10% of all 43s issued in the past six years include uh, cleaning or microbial control. And a couple things to, to think about with this is in, um, just wanted to give a couple of references, uh, USP 1231, water for pharmaceutical purposes, uh, purified water systems that function under ambient conditions, are particularly susceptible to establishment of tenacious biofilms of microorganisms, which can be the source of undesirable levels of viable microorganisms or endotoxins. So endotoxins are fever-inducing particles, uh, typically um, associated with uh, gram-negative microorganisms. Gram-negative microorganisms are commonly associated with biofilm formation, such as Pseudomonas, Rostonia, Burkholderia, uh, very common uh, in regards to uh, biofilms, and they can also, um, they also have endotoxins associated with those. Uh, when we look at um, 21 CFR 211.13, uh, talk about control of microbial contamination, and they, they specify in A, appropriate written procedures designed to prevent objectionable microorganisms and drug products not required to be sterile shall be established and followed. And appropriate RIN procedures designed to prevent microbial contamination of drug products purporting to be sterile shall be established and followed. Such procedures shall include validation of all aseptic and sterilization processes. And the last um, citation I wanted to give is in regards to PIXS. So the Pharmaceutical Inspection Convention, Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, um, and the Guide to GMP Medicinal Products. And they state that at every stage of processing, products and materials should be protected from microbial and other contamination. 
So there's quite a bit of reference in regards to control of microorganisms uh, in the manufacturing of drug products. And I've even seen it in regards to dietary supplements and, and, and cosmetics um, as well. So the potential sources of microbial contamination. Uh, one is the raw materials, and this can be active ingredients and non-active ingredients uh, or excipients. It can be packaging components, so vials, stoppers, uh, any types of scoops or so forth that are used in the process. Um, it can be the personnel that are inter interacting with the product um, and the process. It can be the environment, and this includes uh, the air, um, as well as, uh, and that could be humidity, as well as non-viable and viable particulates. Um, it could be utility systems, such as your water system, uh, your steam. Uh, it can be uh, gases that are introduced. Um, it can also be, um, I've also seen some issues with coolant um, and microbial uh, contamination issues. And lastly, it can be uh, in equipment. So is the microbial contamination a biofilm issue? And this is a question that I get uh, very frequently. And I typically ask uh, a couple questions. One, what is the what is the organism or organisms that have been identified? And uh, so that would go into the genus and species level. Um, is there any history of this microbe on site or related to this step in the process or this product? And do I think it's um, intrinsic or extrinsic um, source for the contamination? And what do I mean by intrinsic? Intrinsic would be something if it's a wet process um, and you have an organism that's common for uh, the water system um, or commonly associated with um, liquids, such as gram-negative organisms like Pseudomonas, Frostonia, um, and commonly form biofilms, and there's a history of this organism, then it's most likely a, a biofilm type issue. If it's extrinsic, would be something maybe related to people. Maybe it's a, a, a staph epi, um, and therefore it, it may be more related to uh, personnel or packaging material and not necessarily uh, uh, intrinsic to the process. So understanding uh, what the idea is, what the history is, and is this organism commonly associated with biofilm really kind of points it to treating it as a biofilm. And that's going to make a difference as opposed to treating it just as a, as a microbial contamination event. So one of the things that the previous speaker, I think Richard, talked about was in terms of understanding the surface properties of the equipment. And one of the things that we see quite a bit, especially in water systems, is the presence of rouge. And rouge is a corrosion product on the surface. It's an iron oxide. It can be different forms of iron oxide. It can have other components within, um, within the iron oxide that produces various colors. So the image on the top right is from a water for injection system. And you can see with using um, a cotton swab that if you wipe the surface, you're seeing red, orange um, particulates, uh, and you have a bright, shiny metallic surface underneath. That's very common for uh, water systems, hot water systems, or water systems um, that are um, treated with a, with a um, an oxidative sanitizer or a high temperature sanitizer, you can have some iron oxide. And what happens is those particulates may move into uh, process equipment and it changes the surface properties of that stainless steel. And you can see then the bottom image of the filling needles, you can see that there is that red-orange uh, discoloration. 
And what we see is that there's an increase in surface roughness and there's um, an increase in, or I should say, a reduction in cleanability and a reduction in sanitization. And I'm going to give you an example for that. Um, and it has a potential to increase in microbial excursions. Remember that a clean system is a first control for the sanitization procedure. So as the cleaning uh, starts to deteriorate, your sanitization or your sterilization is going to start to deteriorate. And depending upon the type of rouge, you may see some reduction in equipment life, especially if you're dealing with um, uh, corrosion such as micro pitting or crevice corrosion, then you can definitely reduce the equipment life uh, for the system. So one of the things to kind of explore this whole cleaning and sanitization is through laboratory studies. So in this case, uh, we have uh, 316 stainless steel uh, discs, and then we have um, generated a type one rouge onto a disc. In this case, we took mild steel coupons, we placed them into a sodium chloride or salt solution, um, we placed the stainless steel coupons, we aerated the system, we mixed it, and as the mild steel coupons corrode it, and the solution is moving, it's depositing iron oxide onto the stainless steel discs. So we have rouge discs and then non-rouge discs. We can place them into a CDC biofilm reactor, and I'm going to explain how this system works in a later slide. And then we can grow, in this case, Pseudomonas aeruginosus inside the biofilm reactor. And now we have discs with rouge as well as with uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosus biofilm. Now we can start to evaluate the cleaning. So in this case, we have, and in the cleaning here, we're looking at total organic carbon, and we're utilizing a swab method to clean that surface. So we have a passive, passivated surface. This is our control, uh, grown with uh, the Pseudomonas aeruginosus using the CDC biofilm reactor and we have a total organic carbon level of 25, about 2,500 uh, parts per billion. We have the rouge coupon. Note we have a larger error here, but we have over 4,500 parts per billion. We then cleaned it using a 1% alkaline detergent. In this case, it's very effective at removing um, uh, biofilm from the surface we're seeing less than uh, 500 parts per billion. However, with the Rouge coupon, we're seeing over 1,000 parts per billion left on the surface uh, with the same cleaning procedure. So we do see that if there is uh, iron oxide on the surface, it can increase the organic carbon that's present, and it can also um, reduce the cleaning performance of the cleaning process. Now this, you know, how does it deal with in terms of the microbial efficacy? Well, in this case, we have our control, um, and this would be our passivated treatment, as well as our rouged coupon. We both have over nine logs of Pseudomonas aeruginosus for our controls, and I'll talk about the method briefly in terms of how that's determined. And in this case, treated it with 30 minutes, 60 degrees, with a 1% formulated alkaline detergent. Uh, the control sample without the rouge, we have complete kill, so greater than nine log reduction. Um, all the samples tested had a complete kill. And then when we actually looked at the rouge coupon, we're seeing some of the samples containing uh, microbes. So we're not getting a full kill of the organisms uh, when there is rouge present. Okay, so in terms of a general recommendation, one is we have to think about the surface and equipment that we need to clean. 
we have to understand the characteristics of the residue and then we have to understand the cleaning and disinfection parameters and that's going to lead to successful uh, remediation of a biofilm uh, within the manufacturing equipment. So the first thing is cleanability and this was covered in the previous uh, presentation but I will uh, briefly touch base on this. One, we need to make certain that we have coverage within the system and that's normally done with riboflavin, normally prepared at 0.2 grams per liter and it's sprayed onto the surface rinsed off and identifies areas that may not have good coverage. And as Richard uh, Chai pointed out, if you don't have good coverage, you're not gonna have good cleaning and you're not gonna have good disinfection or kill of the microbes when you go in ahead and, and perform in that step. So you wanna make certain that that system has been checked for that. You also wanna check you know, valves, gaskets and tubing these soft parts wear over time. The surface characteristics change over time. It is important to understand what the age of these, these parts are. It may be that we need to look at replacing those things and developing a frequency of replacement for those. We also see, I see quite a bit, is that you have connections of a utility system or a CIP system with a piece of equipment. And this area here, this connection, is not part of the utility sanitization. And it's sometimes it's not even part of the equipment cleaning and sanitization. So they reuse these connections, but yet they're not properly cleaned, they're not properly sanitized, and they have a high risk for uh, biofilm growth. Uh, so make certain that if you have jumpers or connecting tubes that they are cleaned and sanitized that's sufficient for that process. And as a previous presenter talked about, the flow rates and pipes, you want to make certain that you're operating within the turbulent flow. So that 1.5 meters per second flow velocity is going to be critical for the cleaning process. Once you get into disinfection or sanitization, turbulent flow is less important. You wanna make certain that you have wet contact time. But for cleaning, you wanna make certain that you have turbulent flow. And there's a nice citation at the bottom, and I'm happy I have rights to share that so that if this is something of interest, you can go ahead and reach out to myself, Beth, or Richard. We'll be happy to share the, the book chapter. The second thing is dead legs, and this is something that you can uh, trap residue and also um, have uh, areas in which you can have growth. And you want to be thinking about the orientation of these dead legs. So this top image here traps air, this bottom image uh, traps, um, holds liquid and also traps residue. Both areas are risk for microbial growth. Uh, so you want to be careful of the length to diameter and you want this to be less than two, uh, preferably less than 1.5. You want to be careful of corners and crevices. As previously talked about, you want to have those things sloped so to allow for drainage. You want to understand the materials of construction as well as the drainability of the system. Uh, so with this image here is a filling system. We have a small uh, surge tank here. And actually when they went to validate this, and this was only, I think it was like three to five liters, um, but it failed coverage test. And they had to remove the spray ball, drill some more holes in it, and then repeat the coverage test. So even if you have small vessels, you wanna make certain that you do coverage tests and to make certain that you have good cleaning and good rinsing to, to start with. Um, in this case, we have that manifold, and then we have multiple drops in the manifold. Um, that's going to, again, be areas in which you're going to potentially have poor flow, um, and that may be problematic. And at the end, you also have a small uh, dead leg. Again, you wanna make certain that the system is sloped to drain, 
and that you have good turbulent flow during cleaning. And this was actually quite interesting because when they went to, this is steamed in place, and what happens is you run steam through this, um, you cannot, you had to pulse the steam and open drain lines because when we originally did the system, we had condensation build up in these, these filling lines. So we had to constantly open drain and then close drain to, while we were steaming to make certain that we didn't have condensate build up in the lines because condensate's gonna reduce the, the temperature for the steam. But that's a, a different different presentation. Uh, so with the with the residue, we want to be thinking about what's the composition of it, how much is present, what is the condition, is it dried on or baked, and then what's the whole time, the dirty whole time. Um, and remember, your cleaning process that you're using is designed based on the process residue. When you're dealing with a biofilm condition, you now have microbial residue that's also present. And in some cases, that's gonna, not gonna be an issue. If you're cleaning a, a microbial bioreactor, then you're constantly dealing with microbes and you're constantly dealing with microbial residue as a function of your cleaning process. So you may not have to modify that by that much. But if you're cleaning a filling line, as seen here, you may be using hot water to clean it. This is an injectable product. This is highly water soluble. This can be cleaned with water. So in that case, the process residue is very easy to clean, but the microbial residue with polysaccharides, lipids, and nucleic acids is going to be much more challenging than your process residue. So you have to look at potentially changing that cleaning procedure as a part of your biofilm remediation. Uh, one of the ways in which that cleaning procedure is designed is using coupon testing. This is actually called out in the World Health Organization's latest revision to um, uh, GMP manufacturing and specifically in regards to cleaning is to uh, investigate your cleaning parameters using coupon testing. Uh, this is showing agitated immersion and showing a coupon that's obviously visibly dirty, um, but it, it's a way in which you can quickly screen parameters such as time, action, concentration, chemistry, uh, temperature, whether or not a rinse is needed, uh, whether or not uh, purified water or potable water can be used. You can really screen a lot of different parameters um, using these types of coupon testing. Um, and develop your cleaning procedure. And it's nice to kind of revisit this before you go ahead and do a biofilm remediation because this, if you don't have a sound cleaning procedure, uh, then you could be leaving some thin films of process residue, in which case um, you want to be looking at a long-term solution for that where you're probably going to be dealing with a biofilm uh, remediation again um, because again the cleaning is going to lead to successful sanitization or sterilization of your system uh, so if you're leaving some thin films behind then it's going to uh, reduce that efficacy <clears throat> so wanted to uh, touch base briefly on that standard method that I was talking about earlier that was used for the Rouge um, investigation uh, this is referred to uh, the CDC biofilm reactor method. CDC refers to Center for Disease Control. And this is um, actually now a standardized method. Uh, this was worked on by the Center for Biofilm Engineering in, at the Montana State University uh, in Bozeman, Montana, within the U.S. They work with the American Standard Test Method. Uh, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency within the U.S., and they have published uh, two methods. The first method, MB1902, talks about growing uh, uh, microbes within the CDC biofilm reactor, and this is under a high shear condition because this um, stir is spinning, so organisms are grown on a surface, uh, under high shear conditions and develop biofilms under high shear conditions. 
So that would be very similar to a water system or a process piping or process equipment. And the second method actually talks about doing uh, uh, colony form and unit counts of the disks to quantify how much microorganisms are there as well as um, you know how much is killed or removed as part of that process um, and this is actually quite a procedure because it's not only removing the microbes from the surface but also trying to break up the microbes from um, the EPS so that you can have uh, consistent counts of the individual microbes using the uh, colony forming units uh, and this was a method that was developed over over multiple years and multiple labs, uh, so it's quite standardized. And I'll talk a little bit more about what type of parameters they are used um, to control this. Uh, but you're looking at media components, you're looking at pump speeds, you're looking at flow rates into the reactor of the media, you're looking at mixing speed um, and uh, and time. Uh, for that for that process, and it's going to be fine-tuned based on the organisms or organisms you're growing onto that. And you can actually run them in series as, as well uh, to increase your your uh, your testing conditions. So I just wanted to share a couple couple uh, experiments using this with Pseudomonas aeruginosus, and the reason why I want to share this is because it can kind of give you some ideas in terms of how you want to be addressing your biofilm in terms of cleaning. Uh, so the first thing is just explore a wet versus a dry condition. So I grew Pseudomonas aeruginosus onto discs and then treated it with water and an alkaline detergent. And we, in this case, A, B, and C represents three different uh, alkaline detergents. Um, and in this case, we did uh, total organic carbon again, so swabbing that that discs, and then doing um, uh, an, uh, disassociation of the organic carbon from the swab, and then testing that. Um, so we have our controls around 2,000, and then we have our water treatment, and we drop it off by 1,000, and then we have our our alkaline detergents. We do see a slight difference between alkaline detergents to keep that in mind. Um, and so not all alkaline detergents are going to be the same in terms of performance. Uh, but you can see here looking at this, uh, I guess it's light blue teal um, compared to the black bars that the wet condition is much easier to clean in all cases in the dry condition. So if you have a wet biofilm on a surface, it's going to be easier to clean than a dried on condition. And that's pretty self-explanatory, but it's nice to kind of see it tested out. Um, also evaluate in this case um, using water at various temperatures compared to an alkaline detergent. Um, in this case, we use the alkaline detergent B that was used in the previous study. We have uh, ambient temperature, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees. And one of the things that you see right away is that um, as you transition from ambient to 30 degrees, you see a much better cleaning performance with the alkaline detergent, and it pretty much levels off as you go up in temperature. However, with the water, we're seeing that you see kind of kind of a step reduction with this. Uh, so 30, 40, 50 degrees, we're not really seeing a whole lot of improvement. When we start to get up into 60 degrees, we start to see an improvement in terms of the cleaning performance. And that makes sense. I mean, this is proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. They're quite uh, difficult to clean, quite tenacious uh, in terms of removal from the surface. And we're seeing that with this. Um, this is um, a lot of times with the stainless steel system, you're really high up in temperature, and that's kind of supported by this if you're using water for cleaning. Um, when you go into more of a, a plastic, you know, something like a PVC or polypropylene or high-density polyethylene, 
a plastic um, system, you're restricted on temperatures in the 40 to 50 degrees Celsius range. So here you definitely want to be looking at an alkaline detergent as part of your cleaning process because you don't have the ability to, to drive that temperature really high. Okay, now we also wanted to explore the use of sodium hydroxide versus an alkaline cleaner. Uh, again, kind of using the same alkaline cleaner B. Um, in this case, we're looking at the same hydroxide level. So the alkaline cleaner is at 0.25%, which contains 0.0325% sodium hydroxide. So really kind of keeping the hydroxide level the same uh, between the commodity chemical and um, the alkaline detergent. We're doing the same thing. We have our untreated using total organic carbon. And then we have ambient temperature, 40, 50, and 60 degrees. We're seeing quite a bit of difference at ambient and 40 degrees between sodium hydroxide and a formulated clean alkaline cleaner. And again, the formulated alkaline cleaner would have things like surfactants and keelants. Surfactants help out in terms of wetting, emulsification, dispersion, really kind of lifting off uh, residues uh, from the surface. Um, and we see that um, quite apparent at the lower temperatures. As you get up in high temperatures, you start to see more of a kind of a normalization. Uh, so it's a reduction of the influence of the surfactants, and you see more the impact of hydrolysis that is due to sodium hydroxide in, in both uh, the commodity chemical as well as in the formulated alkaline detergent. <clears throat> okay, the next thing is you want to be thinking about um, how to kill the organism. Uh, so steam, dry heat, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine dioxide, ozone, our chemical sterilization are all effective. And we want to be thinking about what the critical parameters are and make concern that we're taking into account things like the um, uh, time and temperature, uh, concentration, and the specifics in regards to that treatment, uh, because those things are going to impact the cleaning procedure. I don't know how many times that I've gone in um, early on in my career with water systems and dealing with microbial issues and gone in and steamed the system knowing that steam pretty much kills everything, um, only to realize that the organisms come back and generally much faster than before and much more um, tenacious. Uh, and, and only until you go in and clean the system prior to the steam, you start to see an improvement with that. And that's because, you know, the soil level um, and the bio burn you know, what it is um, can make a difference. So if you do forget the cleaning step as part of the remediation of a biofilm, then you're going to be dealing with the soil. Even if you're able to kill off the organism, it can reattach and grow um, again much faster. So you want to watch the critical parameters as you get into your uh, your disinfection sterilization step to kill the organisms. Now, one of the things I wanted to share, and this was some work that was published in the PDA journal, it was also published in uh, Clean Room Technologies. Um, but when we're dealing with organisms, and I talked about this earlier about understanding the genus and species. Um, that's specifically important if you identify some spore-forming population that's present uh, within the biofilm. And so this is actually some imaging of, of a Bacillus cereus that's grown using the CDC biofilm reactor. And what we have here <clears throat> is the vegetative form, and those are seen as these rods. <clears throat> but we're actually actually seeing uh, spherical spore formers as well. So early on I talked about a change in phenotype, um, but we can also see that we have vegetative form and non or spore form uh, present 
if it's a spore forming population. And this is particularly important because early on I talked about Pseudomonas aeruginosus grown on a on a, a the biofilm model, and we showed that we're in hours. Now, if we take the same organism and and treat it, um, and take a different organism, in this case, be serious, and we treat it, we have even going out, you know, two hours, we're not even seeing a log reduction. Um, of of um of spores so you know you have to kind of understand what that organism is and whether or not it is um is going to be uh challenging to your disinfection or sterilization process in this case we're going to have to treat this as um, bacterial spores and it's going to change how we're going to kill this um, organism how we're going to remediate this biofilm and that's why a B-serious contamination, a B-serious that's expected to grow in biofilm condition is going to be extremely challenging to remediate. And I've seen this case in regards to um, alcohol wipes um, as well as uh, uh, some alcohol solutions. Uh, because the B-serious can actually grow at air-liquid interfaces. Um, and so it can be quite challenging uh, organism to remediate. Uh, so one of the things that we want to be thinking about when we're dealing with a very difficult to kill organism is really kind of understanding that whole uh, cleaning and treatment. So in this case, uh, utilizing the bee serious uh, grown onto uh, the discs, um, we have over three logs, 3.8 logs, um, treat it with an alkaline detergent, five minutes, 60 degrees C, followed by 12% sporicide for 10 minutes at room temperature. We've dropped down quite a bit, but we're still about a log of organisms on the surface, um, roughly a half to a log. When we increase, in this case, increase the time, so instead of five minutes to 10 minutes, um, we see that we have some further reduction and then we go up in time uh, for 30 minutes, we're seeing full kill. Um, so in this case, we're looking at adjusting one parameter, we're seeing an impact of that, but we're utilizing an alkaline detergent to, to clean and then following it with a sporicide to make certain that we kill uh, the, spore, the, the spore form an organism. In this case, we're using a diluted sporicide, um, so it's not even at full strength. Okay, I wanted to share a couple of other case studies. Um, one, this is an oral solid dose manufacturer. Um, they're manufacturing continuous coatings uh, or a continuous coating process, um, in which case they have uh, two different sugar solutions. Uh, one's a high viscosity, uh, so very thick. One's a low viscosity coating, uh, so it's, it's a thin solution. And they would go ahead and campaign using the high viscosity coating. And then they would have a cleaning procedure and then switch over to the low viscosity coating um, and then go ahead and campaign on the low viscosity coating. And one of the things that they saw was that, um, and they would, they would have some low levels. So this is an oral solid dose. So they would have low levels of, of microbes present as part of this coating process. What they saw though was when they switched over to the low viscosity coating, they would see um, the pseudo, in this case, Pseudomonas aeruginosus increase as the time of this continuous coating. So day one, day two, day three, day four, and they would have to stop uh, the coating process because of the microbial level was too high. Um, and so they couldn't do a full campaign. And this happened um, a couple of times. And so as part of this, the, the review, and I said this earlier, what is the organism? Genus and species, what's the history of the organism? Does it appear to be intrinsic to the system? And in this case, Pseudomonas aeruginosus, they have a history of this organism on the piece of equipment. It is, a, loves to be uh, associated with water 
a wet process and that it is a known biofilm former. And the high viscosity is going to reduce the organism's growth. So high sugar content, high salt contents, that's gonna reduce microbial growth generally. Um, and so the, as you switch to the low viscosity, this organism, it has a favorable growth in it and you're gonna see that the population increases. So everything points to this organism is with, inherent to that system and it's established as a biofilm within the system and therefore the best way to address this is a good alkaline cleaner um, that's been known to remove biofilm as part of that transition from that high viscosity coder to coating to the low viscosity coating and able to um, adjust the procedure uh, and uh, prevent this from being an issue moving forward. Uh, the second case study here, this is an objectionable microorganism, uh, E. cloci, um, and in this case, uh, it's associated with the piping uh, and the transfer tank filler. Um, one of the things you also notice is it has that orange-red discoloration. We talked about that. That's the, that rouge, that iron oxide. So we want to be thinking about removing this as part of the remediation. So in this case, using an alkaline detergent. Um, in this case, they've actually taken a, um, a detergent additive to it with hydrogen peroxide improves the cleaning performance. They wanted to take care of this. Um, so they did this 60 degrees, so high temperature, long cleaning time, very aggressive cleaning procedure. But again, they've been struggling with this um, issue for, for months and they wanted to make certain that it was remediated. And then they went with an acid cleaning uh, detergent. In this case, 15%, 80 degrees for three and a half hours. That's a very standard derouging procedure uh, to remove that iron oxide. And it did remove the iron oxide, which is designed to do. And then they treated it with a hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid product, 25 degrees for 30 minutes. And this is known to kill E. cloci. Um, another case study, this was from a water system. Um, and for an animal vaccine manufacturer. In this case, they were able to actually take some sections of the piping and develop a cleaning procedure based on some laboratory models. So looked at the alkaline detergent, in this case, 5% 80 degrees for one hours, followed by 20% of an acid detergent for two hours, and you can clean and remove the iron oxide from the surface. So this is a very good procedure for cleaning of organic and inorganic residue from the surface. One of the things to kind of point out with this is that it had classic organisms, Restonia, Pseudomonas, Burkholderia, that's very common with biofilms. So these are definitely kind of red flags, especially if you have a history of it. Now this one also had a Bacillus non revivable uh, revivable. Um, it's it's French. Uh, I don't speak French, but it's it's basically uh, an anaerobe. So they have a spore forming anaerobe that's present, um, which is quite unique uh, for a water system. Uh, but it's not unique if it's uh, sufficient biofilm within the system, uh, because that can prevent oxygen from getting into uh, that biofilm matrix and it can support anaerobic growth. So by having an anaerobe present um, within the water system really points to not only a biofilm, but a pretty substantial biofilm within the system. So again, um, had some cleaning evaluations, uh, reviewed equipment design and critical parameters. They utilized an alkaline detergent for the pre-cleaning um, they increased the concentration and temperature from the lab studies because they had some restrictions on temperature. Uh, so if you're changing one parameter, you want to think about increasing the other, or changing the other two. Um, and then also the acid detergent, um, there was a drop in temperature, so they increased the time. Um, and then they followed it with a, a sporicide 
Uh, in this case, uh, it was a diluted ready-to-use boracide to 5%, 20 degrees, and they utilized for several hours. Again, they wanted to make certain that it was remediated, but focused on the cleaning to remove organic, cleaning to remove inorganic material, and then finally a procedure to kill the organism. Uh, this is something that I covered earlier, uh, but this is something that is a method that is approved in the, in the U.S. Uh, through the Environmental Protection Agency to now start to have manufacturers have claims on products in regards to biofilm remediation, which is important. Um, so we have the full reference, growing a biofilm using the biofilm reactor model. It specifically talks about Pseudomonas aeruginosus and Staph aureus. Pseudomonas aeruginosus is specific to life sciences applications, water system, production systems. Staph, Staphylococcus aureus is more associated with medical device applications, but both um, are quite uh, common organisms. Uh, it talks about um, the method is um, incorporates um, a single tube method as well. So it's growing the organisms as well as doing enumerations. It talks about um, the log density of the starting material and it's based on an American standard test method. And we are seeing products out there that are now starting to have claims supported of it. So a claim might be something like a broad spectrum disinfectant and virucidal agent that's listed for this alkaline detergent. 1% uh, 60 degrees for five minutes is for disinfection. 1% 60 degrees 10 minutes is for viricide. And this is having a disinfectant claim is a prerequisite for a biofilm removal claim as supported by the Environmental Protection Agency. And then in this case, kills biofilms on hard surfaces, 5%, 60 degrees for 10 minutes, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosus, as well as uh, Staph aureus. Uh, so just to kind of wrap up, and I'll go into questions. Uh, microbial contamination uh, remains a critical challenge to manufacturers, um, and this is for oral solid dose, uh, API. I was one site I was in, they were manufacturing antibiotics, and they were dealing with um, uh, microbial contamination, gram-negative organism, and it was associated with biofilm, and it was due to they did uh, they were they were campaigning. They had a long break in between campaigns. They they thought they dried the system, but all around the gaskets um, were still wet. And when they went and started back up the line, the organism was introduced uh, through uh, um, the gaskets uh, and uh, pump seals. Um, so they had to disassemble everything and do a full clean out and disinfection before they can go ahead and back into production. Uh, so it, and uh, I've talked about dietary supplements, cosmetics, even personal care products, all can be uh, issues in regards to microbial contamination. Um, by biofilm, an organism grown in biofilm can be difficult um, to address. Um, I talked about, you know, it has, uh, it's a defensive mechanism for the organisms, so it can reduce penetration of um, chemicals, it can insulate in terms of dealing with heat stresses, um, it can be uh, quite challenging. Um, we want to be thinking about the remediation. Is the surfaces cleanable? Um, is it engineered appropriately to be cleaned? Um, are we applying the right principles to clean organic, inorganic, material on the surface that is associated with the microbe and the process residue. And lastly, are we using the right approach to kill that organism that has been identified? And if it is um, a spore forming organism, then we want to make certain that we're using the right, um, the right approach. or We're going to see that issue again um, and again uh, with the system. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to conclude the formal presentation and open it up to uh, questions through with you to, 
with um, with the chat function. Yeah, so Paul, I'm making you the organizer, so you'll be able to see the questions tab. So now you can see the questions tab. So uh, request all the delegates to type in your questions in the questions tab so that Paul can see that. And I think we can order, uh, we can answer other questions also after Paul's things are over. So Paul, you're able to see the questions tab? I see one comment right now, but I'm not. Okay, I think you might have to. So I'm, let me see if I can expand this out. Yeah, I'm going to have some issues. So if you can read it to me, that would be great, Uday, if you don't mind. Okay. I'll do that. Uh, okay, let's see who is. If increasing hot water rinse does not address BB excursion, will acid wash help to address BB excursions? Yes, there has been some cases in which an acid wash can help out. Um, and uh, and I know that we just received, uh, Steris has received um, a disinfectant um, prop um, approval for a phosphoric acid-based detergent as well as a citric acid-based detergent. So a hot acid rinse is going to be uh, more efficient than water. Um, however, um, organic material, as the previous presenters, Beth and Richard, pointed out, um, is best cleaned with an alkaline-based detergent. So the acid is going to be uh, better than using water, um, but it may not be fully sufficient to as part of the remediation. Um, Thank you. Uh, if we are unable to find out the root cause during contamination, what are the effective corrective actions to be taken? Yeah, this is a great question um, because a lot of times you can't find that organism directly uh, where it is growing within the system. Uh, so I would always focus in on those hard to clean areas. So things like dead legs, uh, poor slope conditions, uh, er those would be areas that I would look for it. Um, but you don't necessarily have to identify where exactly it is as part of your remediation. And this is why it's important to understand the coverage, cleaning properties of the, the detergent that you're going to be using, because that's going to give you a holistic approach as part of the remediation. So that even though that you can't identify exactly where it is, you expect it to be clean, then you expect it to have exposure to your disinfectant. So don't get upset if you can't find exactly where it is in the system. You, you, the thing to do is just try to do a holistic approach to, for the remediation. Uh, now this is a question about composition of alkaline formulated reagents. Could you be able to comment a little bit on what kind of formulation this is, alkaline? Um, yeah, so anytime that I'm talking about a formulated product, it's going to have components to improve the mechanisms to remove the residue. So oftentimes you'll have a surface actant aging, a surfactant within the formulation, and that can help out with wetting, dispersion, emulsification uh, of the residue, um, as well as so things like lipids are going to are going to be insoluble in water so having surfactants to help bind that help suspend that help remove that from the system is going to be very important it may also have things like keelants in the formulation uh, to help out in terms of reducing um, interference of calcium or magnesium uh, that are present uh, from the cleaning process so the use of um, the formulated product is going to improve the efficiency for the cleaning. And here we're dealing with complex residues. I talked about uh, polysaccharides, which are polymers, um, nucleic acids, lipids. This is a complex soil. 
So you want to be thinking about um, a complex cleaning system uh, to remove it. Now, one of the things when you're dealing with a formulated detergent is to really kind of understand what it, what's there and also that it is efficiently removed from the system when you rinse it. Uh, so don't just pull a product that you don't know what it is and you don't know the toxicity on it and you don't know how it rinses from the system. You should have some of that information on hand so that you can assess that um, that product is going to be rinsed and it's going to be safe to manufacture the next product um, that you're making or the water that you're making out of your system. Uh, what is the recommended dedousing frequency that should be followed typically in purified water uh, distribution loop to avoid complications of biofilm? Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, a lot of times you really want to look at your monitoring process. So you're monitoring total organic carbon, you're monitoring microbial levels, you're monitoring... Um, uh, endotoxin levels typically for your water system. You want to see how that uh, that is um, how that data is trending. And if you have a good design system, it's you have the proper controls in place uh, to maintain a low levels of microbes within the system. Then you really want to reduce the frequency of a of a cleaning and um, a decontamination of that system. So it could be a year, it could be two years, it could be three years. Um, those things are generally, as part of your plan, shutdown activities is a cleaning and um, uh, with an alkaline product and an acid product as part of that. Um, and it should be really kind of um, as infrequently as possible, um, but oftentimes it's it's every couple of years. Now, the image that I showed with the with the rouge uh, in the water system, that's probably been about nine years um, of running without a cleaning um, of the system, and you can see that it was quite it was quite at risk. So as long as you wait, the longer you wait, the harder it is going to be to remediate it if there is an issue with the system. Uh, what is early indication of formation of a biofilm? in pipes and process equipment. Do you have any early indication which can signal you that biofilm is getting formed? Yeah, that's going to be um, a little bit challenging because as I mentioned earlier on, there's a, an attachment, a growth, and then you start to see some detachment. So you may see some very high levels and then low levels. So you may see some um, you know, alerts that come up and then it's running fine. Uh, what you want to do is to kind of look at those um, those hits and are they coming at a more frequent basis? Is there other indications like total organic carbon that's going up? So you look for some signs that indicate that your, your system is starting to move out of control. Uh, and that's what I would be looking at. Um, but I would not jump at the first, you know, um, alert level. I'll be looking at not that alert level in terms of what the organism and then see when's the next one that comes up. Uh, you just mentioned about TOC in your this answer. So uh, mm -hmm. the, the question is about is TOC a dependable analytical method? Well, I mean, anytime that you're sampling, say, a water system, you're taking a small aliquot of what's going through the system. Uh, so Organic carbon, TOC organic carbon, we talked about uh, polysaccharides, nucleic acids, that's all organic carbon type residue. So if you start to see organic carbon increase, then it's, it's generally related to a microbial um, issue and whether or not it's significant enough to address at that time or wait to the next shutdown that's going to give you a good window for that. But again, a lot of times you're sampling a very small set of a larger system. So be cautious in terms of what the, you know, what one point is going to um, tell you to do. Now, endotoxins are going to be quite a bit different. If you're starting to see endotoxins increase, then that's going to give you a strong indicator that you have a micro issue. 
And if you're starting to see endotoxins increase, then you probably have a very significant issue. Um, a lot of times endotoxins gonna be a lagging indicator to TOC or um, your uh, uh, typical microbial sampling. Uh, is Pseudomonas aerogenes an indicator micron organism of water contamination and presence presence of biofilm in water system? So Pseudomonas aeruginosus comes up quite frequently associated with water systems because it's able to grow under low nutrients um, and that it's a common biofilm former. So that is something that normally comes up. Um, but it can be other uh, gram-negative organisms uh, and even gram-positive organisms. It can be yeast, it can be mold. A lot of things, most microorganisms have the ability to um, develop uh, biofilm. They're just not necessarily associated with it uh, with production equipment. But you can see it uh, with yeast and mold and gram-positive organisms as well. Uh, does the CDC biofilm reactor use temperature as a parameter as well? Yes, it would have a, a growth temperature defined um, within the method, and it can vary a little bit based on the organism that you are growing within the system. Uh, so it does, the CDC biofilm reactor methods that I showed, um, specifically talks about Pseudomonas aeruginosus as well as Staph aureus and it clearly defines the temperature for the growth condition of that. If you were doing say a thermophile then you would modify that temperature uh, for, the, for the organism that you're growing it. If you're growing an alkophile, something that enjoys uh, high pH, you would modify the pH of of the media uh, for the growth phase. How long do I have to flush my sample valve while collecting my sample in order to eliminate false positive BB excursions? Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't have a specific time to give you on that, uh, but <laughs> you. But you should have a procedure with that, and it's normally in seconds. Um, but you do want to flush the valve um, because what you have is you have, um, you know, a small exposed area. You may see some hits on that that's not reflective of your system. Uh, so normally you would be uh, spraying that down with either a hydrogen peroxide or 70% uh, IPA. And then you would then do a flush through and you would define the time uh, for that. It's generally in seconds and then you would go ahead and pull uh, a sample. And again, that's kind of a window to your system, a uh, small volume that's captured, uh, and it's gonna give you some indication of how the system's performing. Uh, different clients and different customers have different acceptance criteria for bio burden. What is the recommended acceptance criteria for bio uh, BB cleaning to pass? you know, as an acceptable level of bio burden? Uh, that is a, <laughs> it's a very, very uh, broad question here. You always want to be thinking about uh, what's the impact to the next batch or next product and what's the impact to uh, the patient? Because uh, certain products are going to be at high risk, so therefore you have very tight specifications. Other products are going to be at lower risk, therefore you have a wider specification for that. Um, and likewise, if you're manufacturing products for somebody who's immunocompromised, it's going to be extremely low. Uh, somebody who is, um, the route of administration can come into play, whether it's an oral product or injectable product. So it's quite wide. I tend to go to, um, I look at the, the USP, um, I think it's 1111. Um, that talks about setting uh, microbial limits for sterile and non-sterile products. Obviously, sterile products is going to be zero. Um, non-sterile products is going to be based on uh, the dosage form and the intended recipient of the product. Um, so it is going to be a little challenging in terms of setting micro limits, 
um, I had one case in which it was um, a product, the raw material, it was pH nine and a half. Um, they had a micro spec for the product. Um, however, they had a very low levels of an alkophile that as soon as that was introduced, it would grow up. Um, so they, it's important to kind of understand what the level is, but also what the species are that are present as part of your specification. Uh, so sorry, you day I couldn't necessarily give a true number, but because there's a lot of factors that will play a role. Yeah, a lot of factors. You can't you can't give a single number. It depends. Is it depends on your situation, your product, and your process, like you said. Yeah. Um, uh, now you can you can link it to a water water quality as a good indication with it, and I know some of the specs utilizes for a surface sample around. Um, and they, there's some things out there in terms of surface sampling too. Uh, even if there is no evidence of contamination of a water system, is it recommended to do a periodic, say, annual cleaning and sanitization of the system? Yeah, that's a, um, a fair question. You want to be cautious um, in terms of breaking into a water system to do any type of remediation. Um, if your procedure says that you do it once a year, then you're doing it once a year. Um, if you're basing your procedure on environmental monitoring of the system, then you could look at extending it out uh, maybe two years, three years uh, for the system. So you want to follow your procedures first. Um, and secondly, is take a look at your environmental monitoring. I've seen some companies look at doing some more inline monitoring um, and kind of drive out that that frequency for that remediation. Um, but I see oftentimes once a year, um, but I've seen more companies shift over to every two or three years uh, based on inline controls. Um, and uh, I want to open it up to if Richard or uh, Beth have any questions related to the cleaning, yes. is please uh, feel free to join in as well. Uh, Richard and Beth, you would like to take some of the questions which you, which uh, we have not taken earlier. Okay. Uh, see. Um, sure. Um, I can't see any of the question. Oh, any of the questions. I think you can only share with one presenter at a time. Oh. Okay. So do you want me to read some of it? Yeah, I have one question here as we um. Yeah, I think Richard can see him. The residue build up over time should be part of the visual inspection criteria during clean equipment whole time. So please share your view on this. So basically for this uh, clean whole time studies, uh, basically the objective is to ensure that the clean equipment parts, uh, when you are storing the clean equipment parts, ensure that there's no Recontamination in terms of microbial growth on the parts during your clean whole time. So the uh, vision inspection is typically part of the acceptance criteria. You need to ensure that it's still visually clean. And also, uh, typically, you will need to sample for the uh, microorganism as well uh, in terms of rinse sampling to check the bio burden, make sure that there's no microbial proliferation on the uh, clean parts. Um, I mean, uh, if you suspect that the um, uh, your storage environment, the conditions uh, has a uh, risk of contaminating the clean parts, uh, then you may want to have extra sampling on the uh, TOC and things like that. So typically, I mean, um, it is vision inspection and the, uh, the uh, as for the barbarian levels on the clean parts for the clean whole time studies. Any more questions you would like to take, uh, Richard? Uh, yes, um, there's one more is for big vessels with circulation piping. So which sampling method is better? Whether soap sampling or rinse sampling? Um, of course, the, uh, typically for Cleaning validation I mean, for vessels, big vessels with uh, connection pipings. Uh, you will need to have both rinse and swap samplings. So, in terms of the uh, swap sampling wise, uh, I mean the internal locations of the vessels is 
typically is done and also on some of the fighting connection as well the difficult to clean parts uh, if possible i mean um, especially the uh, outlet uh, drain valve uh, you need to open up the valve and then uh, swap on the uh, diagram uh, part and also along the piping as well i mean if possible to dismantle and then just do some swap during the cleaning validation at least so um, and then also you need to have the rinse sampling basically as an overall uh, check on the cleanliness for those uh, areas which you can't perform the swap sampling so typically both type of sampling will be uh, required uh, here's one one question on visual inspection how to establish acceptance criteria for visual inspection anyone who would like to take that sorry i was still trained i finally figured out how to look at the questions <laughs> so yeah, me too. what was the question i, I can take that um you yeah. um so for visual inspection uh, what you want what i see quite a bit is um using some spiked coupons and um, so you would spike at a known value onto the surface, start off with what your acceptance limit is, uh, and then generally go down from there. And then you have an operator um, observe that and identify um, which ones they can see and take into account lighting and distance and angle. Um, and that's going to, and whether or not uh, safety glasses are used. Uh, whether or not mirrors are used um, as part of that uh, that inspection, and you can use that as to qualify the operators for visual inspection. You got to keep in mind that your study is going to any type of lab study or qualification is going to have to consider the equipment that is going to be vision inspected. So if you have a very large piece of equipment and you're looking through a sight glass, it's going to be very poor detection. But if you have small parts coming out of a parts washer, then you're going to very you're going to have very easy to detect it onto the surface. And I see a lot of times you can easily defend a visual inspection for small parts, um, but it's going to be a little bit more challenging for the larger parts, the larger okay. equipment. Correct. Okay. Uh, have, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. I was going to say I have a question here. I don't know if anybody got to it says, do I have to run my vessel agitator while doing CIP of my vessels? And if I have to run my vessel agitator, what should be the idle percent RPM I have to run at? So um, I recommend running your vessel agitator while doing your CIP. That way you're, you're getting all the sides. But especially if you have a little bit at the bottom, then you're also submerging the vessel agitator. Um, and, and getting the underside if you have a bit of coverage issues. Uh, but the other thing um, with that is that you want to make sure that you have, you know, in order to run your vessel agitator, that you are um, ensuring you're meeting the criteria if you have any uh, vessel interlocks, such as um, uh, level in the, the piece of equipment or temperature in that piece of equipment. So you might have certain interlocks for what the volume level should be before you can run that agitator and then typically um, i would run it slower than you know what you're you're going to use for mixing since you're not really you know you're not concerned about kla in this um, case so you know for a large vessel like 100 rpms or, or something like that so such something slowly um, mix up the bottom of the contents of the piece of the equipment during cleaning and just to expose all the areas of your agitator Thank you. Uh, in an API manufacturing uh, facility, do we look at previous product only, or also we look at impurities and other ingredients? Anyone? Can you Richard? repeat? Uh, in an API manufacturing, yeah. do, do we look at previous product only, or you also look at impurities and other ingredients? So what you want to do is definitely understand uh, what the carryover of the API is, uh, especially as you're going from one API to another. Um, but you also want to evaluate the hazards uh, with any degradants or impurities that may be present. And if you identify that as a hazard, um, then you want to also uh, uh, set some limits for that. 
but generally you're looking at the API uh, and that's the same thing with with BioBurn as well. If you identify that as a hazard associated with that process step, then you or or associated with the product or the patient in which it's going to be uh, administered to, then you want to include BioBurn, uh, whether it's um, microbes and endotoxins or just microbe monitoring. And Beth and Richard, I don't know if you want to add to that or if that was sufficient. No, that was good. Yeah, sufficient. What are the main parameters to be considered for sizing of spray ball for an equipment? For sizing? Do you for want sizing to, um, of, Yeah, sizing of the spray ball for any equipment. Well, you want to look at coverage. You want to look at the throw on it and the pressure going through that spray device, but the throw length as well. So you want to make sure that the spray device is actually able to hit the sidewall of the equipment at the right impingement or we'll say velocity or flow rate pressure, however you're measuring that. Um, there, Richard had a slide on his uh, in his presentation that showed the uh, parameters to consider for spray devices, so they can refer to that slide. Okay. Yeah. You can also just reach out to some of the manufacturers. They'll mm -hmm. they'll actually use some computer modeling to understand what the size and what's the pressure needed into the spray device. Uh, so the main thing is to kind of understand whether or not you want to use a fixed spray device or dynamic spray device, as Richard and Beth talked about. Uh, the fixed spray device or the static spray device is probably the most simplest design and the most um, consistent in terms of performance. Uh, however, you get probably the lowest action uh, for cleaning. As you get into more dynamic spray device, it becomes more at risk to uh, clogging, more at risk to uh, wear, uh, and you have to be a little bit more cautious in terms of monitoring the performance of that. Um, I do have a question I see, let's see here, inside an isolator wall surfaces, how to remove biofilm. Uh, anytime you're dealing with uh, something like an isolator, you're often using um, uh, something that's a low residue, like 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol or 70% ethanol or 6% hydrogen peroxide as kind of a surface wipe. Uh, that mechanical action of wiping the surface is going to be good at removing organic material from the surface. Um, you can also look at using a, a process cleaning agent, um, such as like the alkaline detergent that I talked about, um, or and then you just want to follow that with the uh, um, 70% IPA or the 70% uh, ethanol to remove any residues from the detergent. A lot of times with isolators, um, you're using vaporized hydrogen peroxide as part of your decontamination of that. Vaporized hydrogen peroxide can penetrate biofilms, however, it's not a cleaning agent. So if you're seeing um, significant issue, reoccurring issues with that, you want to think about that mechanical action to remove that organic material from the surface associated with the biofilm and then get back to your routine uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide as part of your isolator decontamination. So there are several questions, uh, but we won't be able to take them now. Uh, we have just two more minutes uh, before our scheduled time of closure for this conference. So we'll just take this last one, uh, which is, is there any way a manual cleaning procedure uh, can be validated? And, uh, you know, what should be the frequency for verification for a manual cleaning procedure? I think with this we will take as the last question of this conference. If any one of you would like to give it a try. Beth, you want to take yeah. this one? I know you well, do some can, training on it. Yeah, can you can you validate a manual cleaning process? Yes, you, you can validate a manual cleaning process. Um, but you uh, the thing is having parameters outlined. So uh, it's going to take a little bit more documentation as far as, you know, instructions that the operators need to follow. There needs to be clear, um, you know, procedures. So you just can't say something like, you know, 
add detergent, scrub, and rinse, you know, you, you have to put some parameters around there, such as, you know, add X percentage of cleaning agent and scrub for a defined period of time. So typically we say, you know, scrub for 30 seconds, you know, or if you want to soak for 10 minutes, scrub for 30 seconds, rinse for two minutes, uh, you need to have those in place. And um, you also want to make sure that you are, you know, if you need, um, you know, images included in your procedures and in your, your protocol. And the frequency would be, I mean, I don't know, you should definitely look at um, training and retraining and validation. I would look at recommending a frequency of maybe once per year. And then anytime a new operator uh, definitely needs to be trained. So, um, but yes, it, it can be, it, it can be validated. It just takes a little bit more um, documentation, I'll say. Yeah, Thank the only you. thing, yeah, the thing ahead, I would ahead, add but... to that, um, yeah, Uday, ahead, is that um, I would, as part of your training procedure, I would also videotape the training so that um, a lot of times with manual cleaning, you have procedural creep. So it would be nice to kind of document, video document the training so that when new operators come in, they can kind of watch a video, see a lead operator perform the procedure, and then have that lead operator watch that operator perform the procedure. So a lot of times that training and that assurance that there is good training in place is going to reduce the frequency for the requalification or the revalidation for manual cleaning. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Thank you. thank you, thank you. So let me take this opportunity to thank all of you, uh, Richard, Beth, and Paul. Uh, 